There you go. Sorry. Uh, yes, I am ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Excellent. Well, hello, commissioners. I want to welcome you to uh, our Metropolitan Planning Commission meeting. We'll go ahead and call the October 22nd, 2020 Planning Commission meeting to order. I want to thank everyone for joining us today on this beautiful fall day. I'm actually looking out the window and the leaves are changing and Hopefully we will get we will get through 2020 and have a new year in 2021 and hopefully be present together in person. Anyway, so to get started, we will actually need to do um, a roll call vote. But before we do the roll call vote, I just want to remind the commissioners of a few housekeeping items. And the first is, if if you would, I know it's kind of hard sometimes, but if you could mute your lines. Um, if you're not speaking that way, um, the feedback, sometimes we get feedback in the system. It's very helpful, and I appreciate everybody doing that, um, especially with all the roll calls. The, the next is when I say raise your hand, that's really, you can raise your hand at home if you would like, but that means the icon hand in the app. Um, and then if you want to speak, you can always unmute yourself and, and speak up, and I'll ask um, for you to speak. Um, the next is, um, as our attorney said last time, just a reminder, make sure if I if I call your name, uh, we just need to make sure that everybody is identifiable. So um, if you speak up, you just need to state your name uh, for the record. And I encourage the council members to do that as well, just so that um, it's clear who is speaking at all times. So my name is Greg Adkins, I'm the chairman um, of the Planning Commission. I appreciate everyone joining us. And so our first order of business um, is roll call. And so um, as I go down the list, uh, if you'll just say present, I'd appreciate it. Commissioner Gobble. Present. Commissioner Haynes. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Ms. Lady Murphy. Present. Commissioner Sims. Present. Commissioner Tibbs. Here. And I'm here. And so thank you. Uh, we have a quorum. And before we start our meeting, we need to establish um, that we actually have a telephonic meeting. And so I'm going to hand it over to our attorney, Alex Dickerson. Mr. Dickerson. Yes, I'm here. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, just uh, the motion that you're looking for is move that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business of this body and the meeting electronically is necessary for the health, safety, and well-being of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Excellent. And so the motion, as our attorney says, it's uh, it, the governor has allowed us to do that through executive order number 16. And the motion that um, that I will call for is exactly that, which is that the meeting is electronically necessary to protect the health, safety, welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Any planning rules that are in conflict with the governor's order are hereby temporarily suspended until the governor's order is no longer in effect. I just want to say thank you to the public for being patient with us uh, and doing these meetings electronically. Um, it's important that the public and the commissioners and the staff team remain safe. Um, and there are still a lot of outbreaks out there. So that, that would be the motion. And so if who would like to make that motion, if you'll raise your icon hand or Commissioner Gobble, you want to make the motion? Uh, so I'll move. That's a proper motion, and we'll need a second. Council Leader, uh, Commissioner Haynes. Second. Proper second. Any discussion, if you would raise your icon hand and or state that you would like to discuss. Seeing no icon hands and no discussion. Seeing no other discussion, we are ready for roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. 
Councilor Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Chair votes aye. Ayes have it. And we are doing the meeting electronically. So our next order of business is the adoption of the agenda. The agenda was sent out to you beforehand and was posted on the website. And uh, Councilor Murphy, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I actually, the my raise hand button had moved, so I found it and I'm happy to make that motion. Excellent. Thank you, Council Eddie. You know, these updates in, in the app sometimes it throw you off on. So that's a proper motion and Commissioner Tibbs. A second. It's a proper second. Any other discussion for the adoption of the agenda, which was sent out earlier? If you'll raise your icon hand or verbally say you'd like to discuss, seeing no dis no discussion, no other discussion, we are ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble, aye. Commissioner Haynes, aye. Commissioner Johnson, aye. Commissioner Murphy, aye. Commissioner Sims, aye. Commissioner Tibbs, aye. Chair votes aye, ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. And so we are on to item D, which is the approval of the October 8th, 2020 minutes, which were also sent to the commissioners. And um, I hope everyone has reviewed that and we will need a motion to adopt those, min to approve those minutes. You'll raise your icon hand and Commissioner Tibbs. Make a motion to adopt the last meeting minute minutes. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Commissioner, Commissioner Johnson, you recognize? I second the motion. Thank you. That's a proper second. Any other discussion? If you would raise your icon hands or any questions or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote to approve the minutes. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Excellent. And the ayes have it. And that was Councilor Murphy. I apologize. Ayes have it. And the minutes are adopted. And so now we are on to recognition of the council members, which is item E. Um, and we just took the took the council members as we see saw you um, enter into the app. So council member Gamble, I, I think you were first. Would you like to go, um, would you like to speak now or during your item? Thank you, I'll just say briefly, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, appreciate your service, commissioners. I am here to speak about the uh, commercial PUD review uh, that the staff did on a PUD that was about 45 years old, and they have made a recommendation for um, to, to recommend that the PUD is inactive and have a uh, uh, either renew or re reinstated or um, consider rezoning it to a MUNA, I have had a community meeting and discussed the um, recommendation and the review and the community and I myself also feels that uh, the MUNA would be a good alternative to the PUD, which uh, the current PUD allows commercial uses. Like I said, it's about 45 years old and there have been, of course, changes in the community since it was initially initiated. And uh, the community, while there is a lot of residential, uh, the MUNA zoning would allow for low intensity uh, residential, retail, and office uses that are, are badly needed in the area. So I would just ask that the uh, once the item comes up that the commissioners consider uh, that MUNA designation as an alternative to uh, reapplying uh, the recommendation to reapply the PUD. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Council Lady. We appreciate you joining us today. 
And of course, if you're still on the line during, and if we hear that case, um, you're welcome to, to speak for sure. All right. Next is uh, Council Member Hurt. I saw you. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to all the commissioners. And it's been a while since I've been before a planning uh, commission. So I'm, I'm happy to be before you today. Thank you again. Uh, I am here in regards to the renaming of 10th Avenue North uh, Circle on behalf of the First Baptist Church Capitol Hill and the Kelly Miller Smith uh, Senior Family. Um, this year would mark the 100th birthday of the Reverend Dr. Kelly Miller Smith Sr. had he still been alive. And the church and family want to honor him in a way that uh, would be uh, fitting or be fitting for this iconic uh, man who was a great civil rights leader in Nashville. He was um, a, a professor at Vanderbilt Divinity School, uh, participated in um, much of the nonviolence activities that took place, the church itself, served as a uh, hallowed ground for the training of many of the Freedom Riders and uh, members of um, the Southern League Conference and uh, Southern Leadership um, Conference. So um, the, the family is, is really interested. It's a block circle that, that circles from Rosa Parks to Martin Luther King Boulevards. And um, the only things that are there is the church, parking lots and one other building. I understand that planning did receive opposition uh, from someone in the building and I reached out to uh, the tenants that I knew that were in that building and no one posed an opposition to me uh, as a result of um, my reaching out and sending an email to them. And I also made a telephone call and did not receive a uh, call and response. So I am here asking for you all to approve the renaming of 10th Avenue North Circle to the uh, Reverend Dr. Kelly Miller Smith uh, way. Oh, thank you, and, Kelly. And thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Welcome back. Always thank appreciate you. you joining us. I appreciate that. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, I saw uh, Councilmember Van Rees. Uh, yes, good afternoon, all. Just double checking that you can still hear me. Um, yes, yes ma'am. Great. Uh, I am calling from the road, and uh, I've been seven hours in the car. I still have two to go. So uh, I wanted to make sure and uh, call in uh, and make some statements here at the beginning. And my intention is to stay uh, all the way through answer additional questions when the items come up. Just in case of catastrophic failure in my electronics, I did want to uh, chime in here at the beginning. Uh, first on item 21, that's the 2020 CDO, uh, the corridor design overlay along Gallatin Pike North of Riley Parkway. This has been a project that began with community discussion during my first term, along with council, former council members uh, Pride Moore and Davis in Districts 9 and 7. Uh, as you know, uh, BL 2019 1540 uh, passed by uh, the previous council uh, with the leadership of uh, Fabian Bedme and Devat uh, Blaylock, along with uh, my fellow second uh, termer there, uh, Kathleen Murphy, uh, created a valuable tool to give what people in District 8 had been asking for uh, along this part of Madison's commercial district uh, that is design standards on new development as it happens uh, for things like signage, landscaping, building materials on front uh, facades and buildings. Uh, I'm more than satisfied with the community input and feedback by the residents in the area and the commercial property owners as well along the vital uh, corridor uh, that have recognized this benefit to them. I urge your prompt and enthusiastic approval. I look forward to carrying this legislation along with current council members Hancock and Benedict to the Metro Council. Uh, I also wanted to uh, make note of item number 23, 
That's 2020Z096PR001. Uh, on its face, this zoning request will look simple. Uh, concern over adding two farmhouses on half acre lots. And there are so many discussions countywide on the proper use of more density is a little unusual. However, this is a very particular lot in a very particular place. I've worked very hard to ensure that as the old Memorial Hospital sites, 52 acres are parceled out. We work with planning staff to surgically make sure that the transition from commercial and mixed use zoning on the artery of Due West Avenue to and into the large suburban lots of Graycroft and Chadwell are protected and preserved. There's been much discussion on this rezoning since August 6th of 2020, when we had our first virtual community meeting. At that time, the request was for three additional homes and the contiguous neighbors requested several different adjustments. The applicant agreed to an indefinite deferral until we could hear more about what was requested and some compromise could be met. Now, a full 13 weeks later, you see before you that compromise of adding two homes and more buffer. As I wrote in a newsletter that was received and opened by 887 District 8 residents, opened, not received, a lot more received it, 887 actually opened it. Uh, I, I said in that newsletter, I am not blind to the fact that with growth comes challenges. Challenge is hard, change is hard. Growing pains are real and not all growth is positive. While it is one of the less desirable undertakings of this position, I have also done my best to relentlessly fight against developments that would not be best suited for District 8 portion of South Madison community. I've turned down countless requests to commercialize residential properties and divide parcels into talls and skinnies. In neighborhoods that pride themselves on being family oriented with lots of green space. I enjoy spending time in my spacious backyard and I want everyone to continue to be able to do that if they so desire. I am pleased to clarify that this rezoning request would entail two farmhouses and preserve the green space to the south we are grateful for the buffer that has been extended away from the homes to the east. While I have no personal gain to benefit on this or any development, I am grateful to be working with an owner who cares for his community's concerns. I ask you to consider this effort made to limit the density on this lot and agree with the planning staff on its appropriateness. Again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to say this at the beginning of the meeting, and I do hope, hope certainly to be electronically still uh, engaged uh, when you reached item 23. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure we take care of you. Next, I saw Council Member Benedict. Thank you, Chair. And uh, just as my colleagues before me have said, thank you all so much for your uh, time and dedication to what's so important to everybody in the city. So I'm going to actually be sticking with you for quite some time, and I hope that um, we are all able to finish up before the WWE event that's going on over on uh, Belmont campus this evening. Hopefully it does not become a WWE event. Um, all of that to say, I am here on numbers 21 and 22. Council Member Van Reese just spoke um, about number 21. Um, the corridor design overlay is something in my section of Madison that is very um, uh, desirable. I've heard we've had multiple meetings on it, as she said, and um, just excellent feedback on it. I think as we look forward to what we want Gallatin Pike to look like, um, this is going to be a significant upgrade to what's going on north of Briley Parkway. Uh, so I certainly would ask for your support on that. And then secondly, I'm here for number 22, and that's the one that I'm going to speak about um, after the public hearing. I believe we'll have some comments, both negative and positive. Um, overall, it's been mainly positive. We've had a number of conversations about it with the community, um, and this, is, this request, um, this case, is the result of a nearby 
uh, actually an adjacent contextual overlay that was uh, put in place that you all approved just a few weeks ago, uh, maybe about 10 weeks ago. So I hope that um, we get a chance to hear from everybody. I know we will, and I look forward to talking with you about that then. Again, thanks y'all so much. I'll be here. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Next, that's uh, Council Member Porterfield. Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. I will um, mirror my colleagues and just thank you all for the important work that you all do for our city and the sacrifice that you make um, to make sure that our city is, is running smoothly. So thank you all so much. I'm here to speak on two items. Uh, item number six, 2019 is 234-001, uh, which is a subdivision of a parcel uh, in our district. We did have a community meeting to uh, discuss this possible subdivision um, with the explanation to the community that, um, you know, the, the community, um, while they can share an opinion, you know, if it, it is uh, under state law, if they meet uh, the criteria, then um, they will be able to move forward. And um, there was not uh, a strong opinion either way from our community um, in support or in uh, in support or in opposition. So I did just want to share. Um, I know that I had spoken with the property owner, and we just wanted to make sure that we uh, got this in front of the community so that they would have an opportunity to give any input. Um, if they chose to, and uh, I do look forward to working with the property owner um, to hopefully uh, put a historic over overlay on uh, part of one of those parcels um, if there is support there. Uh, the second item that I would like to speak in support of is um, item number 15, renaming um, to Representative John Lewis Way. I know that there have been a lot of community meetings about this. Um, Councilwoman Soror, as well as the rest of the committee that worked on this, put a lot of work, um, a lot of due diligence, working with the community to uh, to help make sure that everyone's voice was heard and to make sure that there was support uh, um, in the community. And I also stand in support of this, and uh, I hope that you all will support it as well. Thank you for your time, and have a great day. Thank you, Council Lady. Appreciate it. Next, we have Council Lady Suara. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, you did great. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Council Thank you. I'm also on the road, so I apologize if there's any in and out. Uh, but like my colleague said, I want to thank you all for the great work that you're doing. And uh, it's my first time before you. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm speaking uh, in support of the renaming of uh, Fifth Avenue in honor of uh, Representative John Lewis. I'm going to stay with you as long as I can, but I wanted to speak now just in case we get cut off. Um, we, the Minority Caucus decided to rename Fifth Avenue after Congressman John Lewis because, like many of you know, he had his start in the civil rights movement uh, right here in Nashville. He was uh, a part of a lot of things that has to do with civil rights here in Nashville. And as a student, he came here to go to school with American Baptist and then Fisk University. Uh, if he did not come to Nashville, would he don't know? I, I think the guy, the kind of guy that he is, he would have done great wherever he is. Uh, but most of his activism as a student happened here in Nashville, and the caucus felt it was a good idea to uh, name the street after him. Uh, joining the caucus were so many uh, community leaders uh, that felt the same way, that felt this is something we wanted to do for him. We chose Fifth Avenue because, like I said, there's so many connections to John Lewis, some that I did not even know until the process starts. A lot of us knew about Woodworth. A lot of us knew about uh, the Freedom Riders. Uh, many of us did not think or did not know that uh, there's a connection to him at the Ryman, that he got an award from Dr. Martin Luther King at the Ryman uh, Memorial, all that. Uh, there's also a connection at Jefferson Street. And so when we look at Fifth Avenue from the beginning to the end, we started from Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson obviously connecting to Fisk University. And the Nashville City C Cemetery has uh, the burial ground or the graves of two of the Freedom Riders. I would like to say that Fifth Avenue also had the Greyhound bus station, which is very crucial uh, with the Freedom Riders movement and Woolworths for the same things as well. And so that was the uh, thought behind John Lewis. And we thought we wanted to name it John Lewis' way to show his way of doing things, his peaceful way of making change. 
and he and his colleagues were change makers uh, in changing how things were done in Nashville and the South. Um, we had um, some conversation in the beginning. We, we were not supposed to have community hearings. Uh, as far as I know, we don't have to. It's not required outside of planning. But the, com uh, the committee chose to because we want this to be something that brings the community together. We want the opportunity to be able to answer so many questions. In those hearings, we heard back from the Germantown Salem Town uh, group, the Neighborhood Association. And because of that, we did do an amendment to remove them from it. Other than that, we've not had any strong opposition. Most people have been uh, mostly in support. But I will say that listening to folks, we made another amendment. Uh, the amendment that we made the last one was to change the effective date to January 1st, 2021. And this was because some of the, re the residents were worried that if we do it now, it might impact them changing their address uh, for the election. And we did not want that to happen. So we changed it so that all the election is out of the way, but also because of the businesses. So the businesses, because I, I used to have a CPA firm, and I know that if you want to change your address with the Secretary of State, you do it between January and April with your uh, annual report. And you can also change your address with the IRS when you file your taxes. And so it makes it easy by doing January 1 because then the businesses can do it at that time. I also want to clarify for everyone, there's a lot of misunderstanding or miscommunication or a lot of things that people don't know. When we do a change of address, individuals and businesses actually have a year for the address to be effective. So there was a business guy that contacted me and said the change will be better in the spring. So by doing it January 1st, 2021, businesses actually have until January 1st, 2022 or December 31st, 2021. And so those that wants to do it immediately can, those that want to wait till spring can also do that. The other thing that is also important for businesses to note is that because they have a year, then they do not have to uh, go out and buy new stationaries and buy new letterheads and business cards. They can actually use out their stock and then reprint with the new addresses, which obviously is a business deduction as well. Uh, we're also planning once the renaming is done, uh, the members of the civil rights uh, organization here, uh, Ms. Gloria McKissick, uh, was one of the uh, participants in the sittings, and she's open to actually doing a tour uh, from the beginning of Fifth Avenue, which is now John Lewis, if it is approved, to the National City Cemetery. And I think that when we do this, because this crosses Broadway, uh, Predators game, the Sounds game, this is actually good for businesses because uh, as people are going through these markers and learning about what happened with him and civil rights, they will be looking into the stores, they actually be doing businesses, which I think at the end of the day is great. One last thing that I want to mention is the cost. Um, we look into this, people don't have to change their passport, they don't have to change their deed, they don't have to change the title to their house. The only thing they have to do is their driver's license. And they can do a driver's license without cost if they do not need a card. If they require a card, then that will be $15. That is the only cost that is necessary. The rest of it, um, the UPS, the post offices agree that they will do a mass change for everyone, so they do not even need to contact the post office. NES is agreed to do a mass change as well. And so we're looking in way to make the transition very smooth and anything that can be done officially will be done that way. And as far as the city is concerned, the only um, fiscal notes that I have from public works uh, is 19,000 because some of the works will be done in house. So uh, we have about 10 question and answer page that we put out. Again, we've not had a lot of oppositions, uh, but the few that we had, we've been able to make sure that we address them. And we want it to be something that brings us all together. We want it to be a celebration. Uh, John Lewis fought for that. And I hope that the uh, commission will approve it and that we have the opportunity as Nashville to come together to recognize them. And I hope that the street as people are seeing it, whether they're residents, whether they're visitors, will remind all of us for the things that he fought for and how we as a city, as a nation, as a state, all need to come together uh, and avoid segregation and be more inclusive. Uh, so thank you all so very much. I know I gave a whole lot, but I want to make sure that since I have the connection, say as much as I can, just in case I get caught off, there'll be other members of my committee also on the call. If, if there's any question, if I get caught off, they'll be able to answer it. Uh, but I will stay on to answer any other question, but I do hope that you all will approve uh, this change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Lady, and we appreciate you joining us. Uh, great, great job.
Uh, next is uh, Councilmember Hancock. Hi, thank you, commissioners. Um, Hi. I am very excited for the corridor design overlay as our councilors Benedict and Van Rees, and I'm very appreciative of all the work that Council Lady Van Rees has put into this over the years. Um, Council Lady Benedict and I are coming in at the tail end, and it was the fun tail end where we got to go to the building the cake party with the entire district, and we had a great turnout for that and got a lot of good input and insight and all the feedback I'm receiving is just the pleasure that the residents have had at being involved in the process and looking forward to the future development should this go through. So I'm fully supportive of it. And then I also have an item um, later on in the agenda past Benedict's and Van Reese's agenda items on 26 and I'll speak on that after the public hearing. Thank you, Council Lady. And then I saw Council Member Stiles. I think this is our last Council Member. Council Member Stiles, are you with us? I'm looking. Uh, Director Kemp, do you, do you see? I thought she might. I. I don't see her logged on anymore, but I did think I saw her a moment ago. Hold on, let me, let's check the uh, participants list. Give me one second. Okay. No, I don't, I don't see Councilwoman Styles on. Okay, well, that's okay. We can, um, whenever she joins with us, uh, we, we can, we can go back to her. Thank you. All right. All right. So thank you, council members, for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and then, obviously, um, the council members can speak uh, when when their item when the item that they would like to speak on comes up. And we always allow the council members to speak last in the public hearing uh, with no time restraints. Um, now we are on to our next item uh, on our agenda, which is the items for deferral or withdrawal. And I believe Lisa is back with us. Welcome back, Lisa. Hi, Chairman. Thank you. Glad to be back with you all. This is Lisa Milligan with Metro Planning, and I will be re uh, reading the, the items for deferral or withdrawal. Um, item number one, 2020S-113-001. It's a request uh, to resub for property located in Dixie Pure Food Company subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th meeting. Item number two on page three of your agenda, 2020S-176001, Swinging Bridge Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th Planning Commission meeting. Item number three, 2020Z-119PR-001. It's a rezoning in uh, Germantown. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 14 on page five of your agenda, 2020Z012TX001, a text amendment regarding billboards. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 17 on page six of your agenda, uh, it's a, a in one city SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th Planning Commission meeting. And item number 24 on page seven of your agenda, 2020Z102PR001, a request on Martin and Humphrey Street. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Lisa. And did you say, what was the item after item 14? <laughs> Uh, item number 17. Excellent. So we have items number 1, 2, 3, 14, 17, and 24. Is that correct, Lisa? That's correct. Excellent. Commissioners, you've heard these items for deferral withdrawal. We will need a motion to defer or withdraw these particular items. And we have Council Lady Murphy. So moved. That's a proper motion. Council uh, Commissioner Tibbs. Second. 
to proper second. And is there any discussion? Any more discussion? If you'd raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote on the items for deferral withdrawal. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Councilor Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. The chair votes aye. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred or withdrawn. Now we are on to item G of the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Lisa? As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As noticed to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number four on page four of your agenda, 2020 SP 037001 3rd Avenue North. It's a request to rezone from IR to SP for properties located on 3rd Avenue North to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number five, 2020 SP 044001. West Trinity. It's a request to rezone from RS 7.5 and R6 to SP for properties located along West Trinity Lane and Brownlow Street to permit 312 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number six, 2019-S-234-001, the Doral Property Subdivision. It's a request for final plat approval to create four lots on property located at 2000 Old Murfreesboro Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number seven, 6086-P-004, North Lake Village Revision and Final. It's a request to revise a preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for a portion of the North Lake Village Planned Unit Development District for property located on Old Hickory Boulevard to revise the building layout for existing retail use and to add a drive-through. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number eight, 7583P005, the Elysian Fields PUD cancellation. It's a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development for a property located on Elysian Fields Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number nine, 177-74P005, Century City West Revision. It's a request to revise the preliminary plan for a portion of an existing planned unit development on property located at 26th Century Boulevard to permit an additional 275,600 square feet of office and retail space. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 10 on page five of your agenda, 20669P002, the Harding Place Center revision. It's a request to revise the Harding Place Center planned unit development for properties located at 309 South Perimeter Park Drive and on Harding Place to permit auto sales uses. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 11, 2020Z 107PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on Lucille Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 12, 2020Z 118PR001. It's a request to rezone from AR2A to RM20NS for property located on Mount View Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 13, 2020Z 124PR001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to MUGNS for property located on Vantage Way. Staff recommendation is to approve. 
And under other business item I on page seven of your agenda, item number 27, a contract renewal for Bob Lehman, and item number 31 to accept the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. And so the items that we're um, approving on the consent agenda are the following. Items number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 27, and 31. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. And commissioners, you've heard the items to approve on the consent agenda all at one time. Is there a motion to approve? You'll raise your Commissioner Tibbs. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. It's a proper motion. And Commissioner Haynes. Second. It's a proper second. Any discussion? If you would raise your icon hand or verbally state you would like to discuss. Seeing no other discussion, we are ready for a roll call vote on the consent agenda. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Councilor A. Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. I'm sorry. Ayes have it, and the consent agenda is approved. I do want to make a, a, a note that um, that I'm excited that uh, for our executive team and Bob's renewal contract. So I want to say thank you to Bob uh, and the director and the team. I feel like we we have the the team uh, is operating in a very very good fashion, especially uh, under the COVID conditions. So I just want to say thank you to Bob for agreeing to, to uh, continue his hard work at the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Bob. We appreciate you, my friend. All right. We are now on to the items to be considered. And I believe, and Lisa, you, you may have to um, correct me here, but I believe that there's 10 items. Um, and so, Commissioners, uh, don't get scared. I know that seems like a lot of items, but if we even have one person that is in opposition, you know, just like the consent agenda, we'll pull it off of the consent and, and make sure that we, we hear the case. So some of these uh, hopefully will not have a, a ton of opposition, um, but we'll work through that tonight. Um, and so I don't think that we're going to be here uh, a, a super long time, but we'll work through these expeditiously but the items that uh, we are considering tonight are items 15 16 18 19 20 21 22 23 25 and 26 um, and so we I just want to um, Lisa is that correct is that the correct list hi chairman yes that is correct Excellent. And so now we're on to the public hearing portion of the meeting. And so what that means is for listeners at home, we have provided multiple ways um, for you to participate in the telephonic meeting tonight. Um, and normally we take the applicants first and then the, the supporters. Uh, we take applicants first, then supporters, then opponents. But because of the different ways, um, for people to participate, we'll be taking supporters and opponents together. So that means that you need to make sure you clearly tell us if you oppose or uh, support a, a particular project. As usual, we took uh, emailed comments through Tuesday um, at 3 p.m. At the start of each public hearing, Lisa will give uh, our staff team member, Lisa will give a summary of how many emails, um, comments that we've received on a particular item. Uh, and if they were in support or opposition. We'll have a call-in number for members of the public who wish to call in and testify. Please wait until the public hearing for your item begins before calling, but please, uh, you don't have to wait until everyone speaks because when you call, you'll be placed into a queue. If you're calling in, please be aware that there is a legally required 30-second delay, which means 
you're watching your screen, it's going to be delayed. So just focus on the phone call, and I will let you know when to speak. Please state your um, your name and your address, and everyone has two minutes to speak. Um, so we've already went over which items we are considering tonight, and so now we are ready to hear item number 15, the presentation. Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is... Uh, Commissioner Gobble. I apologize. I own real estate on Fifth Avenue. Should yes, I sir. accuse myself on this one? I, I think that's probably prudent. Uh, let's ask our attorney. This Mr. is Alex Dickerson. Dickerson. Yeah, this is Alex Dickerson. Um, obviously, the decision about whether or not to recuse yourself is up to the individual, so I don't want to profess to be giving legal advice to any individual commissioner. But um, I think it would be prudent in this case to recuse yourself if you have property on this. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I, I will recuse myself from this item. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gobbles uh, recused on item 15, and we'll make sure we note that at the end of the, during the vote. And we are ready. So I believe that, who's the staffer for this? Hi, Chairman Atkins. This is Lisa Milligan. I will be presenting this item. Excellent. Go ahead, Lisa. Great. This is Lisa Milligan with Metro Planning. Item number, for, number 15 is a request to rename Opry Place, 5th Avenue North and 5th Avenue South to Representative John Lewis Way North and Representative John Lewis Way South. As originally filed, this was a request to re rename the entire length of Fifth Avenue um, from the historic cemetery to Interstate 65. The uh, request was actually amended at council, and the, now the request is to rename the portion of Fifth Avenue and Opry Place from the historic cemetery to the south um, up to Jefferson Street, the part that was north of Sef Jefferson Street, which is primarily Germantown and Salem Town, was removed from the request. Just so, uh, just as a bit of a refresher for everyone, we don't we don't get these at the Planning Commission very often. The street renaming process is outlined in um, Title 13 of the Metro Code. Uh, any street renamings are referred to the Planning Commission as a mandatory referral. They are also referred to the ECD Board. The ECD Board has recommended approval of this request. They're also referred to historic, and historic is required to make to provide a report directly to council. The report will um, reflect on any historic meaning of the existing street name. Um, as a reminder, council makes final decisions. I apologize. Uh, council makes the final decision on any street renaming request. As information on this application, the application was submitted to the planning department on August 28, 2020. Notices were sent to all property owners with addresses or frontage on the effective street on September 4, 2020. Uh, we provided a two-week time period in which um, people that received the notice could provide comments either in support or opposition to one of our staff members. We did receive comments in opposition. Once we received comments in opposition, we set an MPC date. On street renamings, if we do not receive any opposition, then they can be handled administratively. Um, after we set the MPC date, the request was amended at council to include areas north of Jefferson Street. Uh, the notices, new notices were sent to all of the original recipients on October 7th. And the notice that was sent for the Planning Commission did specify that the area to be changed, the area to be, the area of the street to be changed had been amended at council. But we did go ahead and email the same people. Um, staff recommends approval and that the consideration of this be sent to council for their further consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And so we'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. And I think it is um, really important to note that uh, I don't think I've seen one of these for a really long time, a signed hearing. And so 
mostly what we do is is just to make sure that um, we look at it from a technical perspective, not a political perspective. So, um, Director, do you have anything to add to that? No, just just that I I agree. We we circulate it to the departments um, and such folks such as EMS to make sure that they're able to check their records. And so that's um, when you mentioned technical, um, you know, that's the work that we do. And and generally, this the decision about the name itself is is a council one. But you're right. We don't we don't typically bring these to the planning commission. And. So with that said, it's, I think it's important to limit our uh, discussion. I mean, you can say, you know, say political things if you want, obviously, but I think it's traditional that we try to stick with the scope of, of why we, we look at these. And so um, you, you all have the staff report. And I, I do want to say thank you to the council member, um, Suara, who brought this, and she's actually actually the applicant for it. So, is the council lady still on? If there's council lady yes. Suara, I'm here. Is there? Thank you. Is there anything else? I, I know you 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 spoke um, before the meeting, but is there anything else? You're you're technically the applicant on this. So, is there anything else you would like to say? Um, no, I I I, I think you got it. I think people. We did have a public hearing, uh, not required to, but we did do three, and we uh, allow folks to give us input, and uh, overwhelmingly the people that responded are in support of it. I think the opposition that we had that was most was in Germantown, which is why uh, we excluded that part. And so everything we've done so far is in response to those hearings and talking to people and listening. And uh, I think as part of the application, I supported about five letters, American Baptist, uh, the Bridgestone, the uh, Ryman uh, Country Music Hall of Fame, and some of the businesses on Fifth Avenue that I've also said they're in support of this. So um, I know it's a council decision, but we wanted to make sure that if this is something bringing everybody together, we want it to be overwhelmingly uh, positively received. Uh, and, and that's what's happened based on the hearings that we've done. So thank you. Thank you, Council Eddie. And I personally really appreciate um, how much public input um, that that you've done and we uh i know many of the commissioners and myself uh really appreciate um the public hearings and the public input and so um as the applicant we'll save obviously uh if if there's any rebuttal at the end uh, the council lady can can speak at that time and so now we are at the portion where we take calls from the public um, who wish to call in your screen should show a call-in number please call in now uh, on item number 15. Um, please, you'll have two minutes to speak. Please state your name, address, and if you're in opposition or uh, for the proposal, support the proposal. We're not able to display the timer visibly, um, and so Sean will keep track of your time, and she will let you know when you have 30 seconds left, and then we'll let you know when you run out of time, and we really appreciate everyone for um, recognizing the time limits. Um, and so we uh, are ready for folks to call in, but our first question is to Lisa. Back to Lisa. Did we get any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. We received five um, emails in support and three emails in opposition. Thank you. We appreciate that. And so now we're in time for to hear from the callers. Sean, do we have any callers? Chairman, we do have callers in the queue, so we'll get the first one um, pulled up and I'll let you know when they're in the meeting. Thank you. Appreciate it. Chairman, you have the first caller. Thank you. And welcome to the meeting. And you have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address. And Thank you, Chair. You may be uh, my name is Bill Reed. I'm at 865 Robertson Academy. Uh, and I'm calling in favor of item 15. I'm honored to be a part of the committee to rename a part of Fifth Avenue to 
Rep. John Lewis Way. Uh, when this opportunity was first brought to my attention, it just seemed obvious for me to be a part of this renaming, and it's been really great to work with the other committee members, especially our fantastic chair and leader, Council Lady uh, Solfat Suara. There are a few, late, a few people in history like John Lewis, someone who's enjoyed such universal acclaim and respect, while always be willing to work to shake things up and dislodge the status quo in the name of progress. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with uh, Jim Cooper in D.C. at the time when John Lewis was in Congress. And he just had a presence about him and a reverence from his colleagues like none other. He earned respect from uh, folks that uh, both agreed with him and those that disagreed with him, and something we just don't see en enough of these days. Uh, part of my duty on the committee was reaching out to the many businesses along this to build some consensus and get letters of support. Uh, very pleased to say we've gotten some powerful letters of support from many of the prominent residents along Fifth, including Ryman, uh, the Ryman Auditorium, uh, Bridgestone Arena, the National Predators, Country Music Hall of Fame, the Hilton Hotel, uh, Jerritan Development, uh, the owners of the 505, the tallest building on Fifth, and the Museum of African American History. Uh, a lot of these folks carry different interests and point of view, but they all agree Fifth is the right street to rename because of its prominent visibility, its place in the civil rights movement, and because of the things that John Lewis did along Fifth to shape it. We all know the history that took place in the 60s at Woolworths on Fifth uh, during the lunch counter sit-ins when Rep. Lewis is a young man famously sat down in order to coke and a hamburger. Uh, we did some research at Rhyme, and we also learned about 30 seconds. Representative Lewis was awarded a scholarship on the Ryman stage during a tribute to the Freedom Riders at the 1961 annual meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was none other than Dr. Martin Luther King himself that awarded that scholarship uh, to uh, John Lewis to Fisk. So it's my hope that this will uh, stand as a symbol to the past, a, a powerful history that's taken place nearby and inspire Nashville to work for a better tomorrow. When people visit Nashville to see John Lewis Way, his legacy will ever, forever send the message that we're a diverse and welcoming city and something we can all be proud of. Thank you, Chairman Atkins. Thank you for calling in. We appreciate it very much. Next caller, Sean. Chairman, you have the next caller. Welcome. Yes, good evening. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Chairman Atkins and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, this is Vivian Wilhoy, uh, property assessor, not tax assessor, um, calling to speak on item 15 in reference to renaming the John Lewis Way, um, Fifth Avenue to uh, John Lewis Way. This is an exciting time. I am very honored that Council Member Suarez allowed me to be one of the members of the committee and my office providing information in reference to um, the locations and um, the various property owners in the area. Um, this was something that my entire staff was and very excited to be a part of to provide the information. Um, I think it goes without saying uh, what Representative John Lewis meant to and continue to mean to the social change of Nashville and all the United States and across the world. This is just a small way to honor him. And I cannot see, and I don't think that anyone else could see, but this small, small, small way is a big way of just saying thank you, Representative John Lewis, for all that he has done. I want to thank also um, publicly here, again, Council Member Swarya and the entire committee for all of the dedication to this initiative. It was uh, something that people did with great love. And, and with uh, one of the things I do want to also point out is that Council Member Suarez, she definitely provided the ears in reference to listening to the community and allowed us to be a part of that input. So I ask for your vote for this very small but big way in honoring Representative John Lewis and renaming Fifth Avenue. I am calling in. Oh, you have 30 seconds. And I think I missed saying that my address is 1029 Flint Lock Court, Nashville, Tennessee. Vivian Wilhoyt, thank you so much. We ask you for your vote, and I ask all of you to stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling in. We appreciate it. Next caller, Sean. Chair, we don't currently have any other callers in the queue, so we'll take a brief pause here in case anyone is trying to reach us, and then I'll check back in. Thank you.
Chair, this is Sean at the call center. We have no other callers in the queue for this item. Thank you, Sean. Council lady, we're back to you. Uh, there was no opposition. Is there anything else you want to add? Oh, nothing except that I hope you will approve, the council approve, and we go on to celebrating and coming together as a city. So thank you all so much. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this. We appreciate it. Thank you all. And so with no one else wishing to speak, uh, I declare the public hearing closed. And commissioners, you know, we usually, since we have so many items on a couple of these where we don't get any opposition, verbal opposition, um, I'm going to try to just ask if there's any discussion and if you want to speak on a particular item instead of going through each one of us. So we're going to try to do that since we have so many items. Mm -hmm. So commission, uh, we're on to discussion now. Um, is there any discussion? If you would raise your icon hands uh, to discuss. Um, and I think the staff did a good job. The team did a good job in explaining and the council lady explaining the position. So any, I don't see any icon hands. So if, if there's really not a lot of discussion, maybe uh, uh, it's proper for a motion. So Commissioner Hain. Move approval of staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion and Commissioner Tibbs. I'd second that. That's a proper second. Any other discussion on this great initiative? If you raise your icon hands or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Really quick, See. I would just like to say, I I won't belabor this, but I do think this is uh, long overdue. I actually thought we already had uh, a street named, and um, I definitely, uh, this is going to be great for Nashville. Thank you, Commissioner Tibbs. That's very appreciative. So seeing no other discussion, we have a proper motion and a second, and so now we are ready for a roll call. But Commissioner Gobble. Uh, I'm recused, but it's good oh, idea. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you, uh, Commissioner Gobble is recused. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Councilman Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Uh, I enthusiastically and gratefully say aye. Thank you. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Chair votes aye, ayes have it, and item 15 is approved. Thank you, Council Lady Suara. We you appreciate so much. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And all so right. now we are on. Thank you, Council Lady. We are now on to item 16. Item number 16. And who is our staff team presenter? Hi, Chairman. This is Lisa Milligan. I will be presenting, hopefully without the assist of my dog this time. Hey, uh, you know, they, they were trying to help. So <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get a word in. Yes. Well, All I right. see okay. her, so we should be okay now. Um, uh, item no number idea. 16 is a street renaming of 10th Circle North to Reverend Kelly M. Smith Way. Uh, this map is showing you the area. The original request was to rename it to Reverend Kelly M. Smith Circle. It was amended at council to change the name to Reverend Kelly M. Smith Way. Uh, you can see the uh, properties that have frontage along 10th Circle North um, highlighted in red. Again, the street name renaming process, I went over this on the last um, presentation. Um, I will note that the ECD board has also recommended approval of this request. In regards to the application, the application was submitted to planning on September 15th. Notices were sent to all the property with addresses or frontage on September 16th. Uh, we provided a two week time period uh, within which to receive comments. We did receive comment in opposition. The request was amended at council to change from circle to way. NPC notices of the amended request were sent to all of the same recipients on October 7th. Uh, staff recommendation is to re approve the renaming request so that council may consider the application. Thank you, Lisa. We'll open this item for public hearing and uh, the applicant is uh, like the last one. It's Council Lady Hurt. 
So, Council Aid, you spoke on this before, but anything else you want to add? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. I really appreciate you and the Commission again. I spoke about uh, Reverend Dr. Smith being a professor at Vanderbilt uh, Divinity School, where he also served as an assistant dean. But he, I'd like to say he was a professor of his parishioners and a professional, uh, pro professor of the community at large. I didn't have the good fortune to be able to be a student of his while he was alive, but I have been since his passing. But I did have the fortune to be a student of his widow, uh, Alice Smith, who is still uh, with us. So I just wanted to give her a shout out because she was an amazing professor and, and, and really pushed me to, to excel. So I just wanted to recognize that and, and ask uh, for your support of this uh, very wonderful celebratory upcoming birthday in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. We appreciate that. And so uh, we obviously we'll we'll save uh, time for you uh, for a rebuttal for a rebuttal. Uh, so we are now ready to take calls from members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show the call in number now, so you can call in now. And you don't need to wait um, because you'll be placed in a queue, so you don't have to wait till till everyone finishes speaking. Um, as a reminder. Please only call in on the current case, which is case number 16. When you begin your testimony, this I want to remind you to state your name and address. You have two minutes. Um, and we're not able to display the timer. Uh, so Sean will let you know when uh, you have 30 seconds left, and then we'll let you know when uh, your time is up to speak. And we appreciate you recognizing that. So as we wait for callers to get in the queue, uh, Lisa, what about emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. We did not receive any written uh, correspondence to the Planning Commission on this item. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to Sean. Sean, any callers in the queue? Chair, we do have callers, so we'll get the first one lined up, and I'll let you know when we have them in the meeting. Thank you. And Chairman, you have the first caller. Welcome. Hello. Hello. You recognize. You got two minutes. Please state your name and address. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman and others who are part of the commission. My name is Kelly Miller Smith, Jr. I live at 2506 Walker Lane, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. I am also the pastor of First Baptist Church Capitol Hill in Nashville, Tennessee, 625 Rosa L. Parks Boulevard. Uh, we made the request um, for the changing of the name of the street to our 16th pastor, who so happened to also be my father, uh, who served as pastor of First Baptist Church Capitol Hill for 33 years. Uh, um, my father, uh, Dr. Smith, was very important uh, to a lot of what went on in Nashville, particularly in the late 50s as well as the uh, 60s. Um, one, uh, I have a sister who was a part of the original group that uh, desegregated the schools uh, here in Nashville. Uh, additionally, that um, Martin Luther King Jr. was brought to Nashville by my father, uh, James Lawson was brought here as a part of a collaborative effort uh, with my father and others trying to do the um, preparation for the sit-ins that happened in Nashville. My father also was the one who uh, invited John Lewis to the meeting that got John Lewis involved, and I appreciated hearing the recommendation that came just prior to this regarding naming the street uh, John Lewis Way, representing John Lewis Way. So he has been, my, my dad was very uh, instrumental in a lot of things that, as I believe, and as I say in many of my public um, statements, was very crucial for helping Nashville even to get to the place where it is now. And so, Hello, you have 30 seconds. 
okay, a, a more open and more acceptive, uh, accepting kind of community. So it is, I am asking that uh, the, commit, the commission will vote in favor of this recommendation and uh, we will honor, as we would honor my father's 100th birthday, which will be on October 28th. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling in. We very much appreciate it. Next caller, Sean. Chair, there are currently no other callers in the queue, so we'll take a pause in case anyone is trying to reach us, and I'll check back in. Thank you. Chair, this is Sean Shepard at the call center. We have no other callers in the queue for this item. Thank you, Sean. And so we are ready for the council lady. Do you have any anything you want to add or there was no opposition? So No, I just thank you all very much for your service. Thank you for joining us today. We we really appreciate it. So seeing no one else to wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so uh, we'll try this again. Uh, it's, it's an item that doesn't have any opposition. So if, if the commissioners will raise your hand to, to, if you would like to say anything, I saw Commissioner Haynes, we're on discussion. Before I make a motion, I just wanna take the opportunity to tell you how closely we have had the chance to work with the Capitol Hill Baptist Church and Reverend Kelly Smith Jr. at Capitol View. They have been incredible neighbors. Uh, we. Uh, appreciate the patience they've shown during construction and the history of Dr. Smith Sr. Uh, exudes through this North Gulch uh, Capital View District. And so we're, we're proud and I will make a motion to approve staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. And is there a second, Commissioner Tibbs? A second, the motion. It's a proper second. Any other discussion? on this really good project. And if you'll raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing no other discussion, we are now ready for roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Chair votes aye. Ayes have it. And item 16 is approved. And so now, I, thank you, Council Lady. We appreciate yeah. you, Cut. Thank right, you. So I, yeah. I do have one other thing I wanted to say. I wanted to um, tell um, my former colleague, uh, Commissioner Johnson, that, um, that I feel um, pain for the loss of her uh, pooch. And I just wanted to let her know that I um, am praying for her. Thank you, Council. It was very nice. Thank you. And, and we all are praying for her. Thank you. All right. So now we are on to item number 18. And I think, uh, is Amelia going to do that? Hi, sorry, I was double muted again. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, hey, Amelia. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, Go this ahead. is Amelia, thank you. This is Amelia Lewis with the planning department um, presenting item number 18 tonight. Um, next slide, please. The request is to rezone from residential single family to specific plan SP zoning to permit a multifamily uh, mixed-use development. Next slide, please. 
staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the whole site shown on the screen in gray is 3.64 acres comprised of two abutting parcels on the east side of Dodson Chapel Road. Um, as you can see, the site is generally located south of the intersection of Central Pike and Dodson Chapel Road. Um, at the intersection um, north of the site, it's primarily um, mixed use and commercial with more intensity focused at the intersection. Uh, the property stepped down in intensity as we move away from the intersection and towards the site. Um, and these properties also become more residential in nature. Um, as you can see from the site as well, um, the site is surrounded by residential uses. Um, there's some multifamily um, to the east of the site as well as one and two family south of the site and additional one and two family um, east of the site across Dodson's Chapel Road. Um, next slide, please. Here is the proposed site plan for the site. Um, this ST would permit a maximum of 60 units um, and some live work units in the buildings that are shown on the screen in blue. Uh, Dodson Chapel, you can see, is on the left side of the screen, um, so it's oriented north. Um, the plan proposes two unit types. Stacked flats, which are shown um, with SF on the um, image, as well as uh, attached townhomes. Um, some of the units are oriented to base Dodson Chapel Road with primary entrances uh, to engage the street frontage here. The live work uses are limited to the northern portion of the site um, with the buildings shown in blue. Um, the proposed SP does provide um, specific use as well as size limitations for the live work units, um, for the live work uses within the unit. The stacked flat buildings, again shown with SF on the plan, are limited in height to three stories and 50 feet. And the attached townhomes are limited to a, tight, to a height of three stories and 45 feet. The plan has a mix of surface parking as well as rear loaded garages for the townhome unit. The site has two vehicular entrances, um, which are one is shown just south of the blue um, live work units, as well as one at the very um, southern portion of the site. Um, those are the two vehicular entrances into the site. Along Dawson Chapel Road, the plan shows a bikeway as well as a um, plant, large planting strip and six foot wide sidewalk in accordance with the major and collector street plan. And next slide, please. Uh, there are two policies on the site, which is outlined in red on the screen. Um, the Northern policy is suburban neighborhood center um, and the Southern policy is suburban neighborhood evolving. The proposed plan addresses the specific goals of both policies as the policies have many uh, similar and overlapping goals, including the creation of creating uh, suburban neighborhood development, increased housing choice, and improved connectivity. The live work units are limited to the portion of the plan um, within the neighborhood center policy, which is appropriate given the intent of the policy to create neighborhoods with a mix of residential and commercial uses along suburban streets. The section of the plan serves as a, as a transition between the commercial and mixed use uses at the intersection and the southern portion of the site, which is primarily um, residential. The southern portion of the site and neighborhood evolving policy um, is, or, sorry, southern neighbor, the southern portion of the site in the neighborhood of Alton policy is only residential, which is consistent with the properties um, around that portion of the site. Um, the plan is consistent with the both policies to create residential neighborhoods with moderate density development, um, increased housing choice, and improved connectivity by providing pedestrian infrastructure where it does not exist on the east side of Dawson Chapel Road. Next slide, please. 
as this development aims to provide intensity adjacent to the corridor, transitioning from commercial to residential uses, while also being compatible with the surrounding residential character. Um, overall, the plan is consistent with both policies to provide neighborhood development, increased housing choice, and increased connectivity. Um, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. We'll open this item for public hearing. And is Sean is the applicant on the line? Chair, we do have representatives from the applicant on the line and they are unmuted and can be recognized when you're ready. Excellent, so the applicants have 10 minutes uh, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal and please state your name and address and you may begin. Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, thank you for your time today. I know today's a very adventurous day for a meeting. Um, I'm Ben Miskelly. I live at 2844 Surrey Road that's Nashville 37214. Amelia explained this really well, so I'm gonna to try to keep it brief just to get you through this meeting. Um, I'm the property owner and the land planner for this Dodson Square development. I'm also a longtime resident of District 14 where this is located. Um, as Amelia noted, this property is basically on the intersection of Dodson Chapel at Central Pike, just a little south of it. If you've been here in Nashville a while, you may remember Benson's Grocery was kind of on that corner. Um, both those streets by planning have been identified as corridors. I love this district. I wanted a chance to kind of help improve it. Um, I've always seen this property as kind of that weird transitional piece between the commercial properties and Cherry Creek apartment complex, and then all the residential to the south. Um, I feel like planning nailed it when they kind of named this as evolving policy and neighborhood center because it really is kind of how this prior parcel feels like it should develop. Um, as Amelia said, this is a 60 unit uh, development. Um, it's all for sale product. We kind of divided it into uh, two different unit types. 24 of those are small condominiums, uh, one bedrooms. Some will be one bedroom flex with like a small office or a dining room and then 30 townhomes that are all rear loaded. Um, to match the policy, we also included six live work townhomes as are in blue in that, that image. Um, we felt like this was good for the area and two with everything that's going on right now, it just felt like the right use to include in this. The whole intent of this plan was with this style development to step it down as it gets closer to the single family. Um, our goal here really was to provide opportunities to make the park and Summit Hospital and all the commercial space walkable. Um, when Councilmember Roten spoke to um, the Donaldson Hermitage Neighborhood Association and a couple other meetings I've heard him speak, he's called this area downtown Hermitage. So we really felt like something with this feel with the library and community center there kind of helps to kind of accomplish that. We tried with this to make it kind of feel like that urban downtown. Um, we screened the parking from the street. We provided green space kind of up front so that it's seen when you walk by or drive by. And then in big, we really felt a need to kind of help with the community as far as some infrastructure needs go. With the MCSP, it called for right away, which we were fine with. Um, we dedicated in 15 feet of additional right away. Um, this is gonna help kind of create a bikeway through there and sidewalk infrastructure that is desperately needed if this is a walkable area. But it also helps extend that turning lane. Um, if you've ever driven through there at Central Pike and Dodson Chapel, that, that intersection is just super tight. And so having a little bit more breathing room there to kind of get cars to the intersection, we think is gonna help the community as a whole. And that's really all that I have, so I can save my two minutes. Thank you, and we will save your two minutes for a battle. Appreciate you calling in. So now we are at the time where um, we're gonna take mem uh, calls from members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show call in number now, so please call in. You don't need to wait. Um, as you'll be placed into a queue. We're on item number 18. So call in only on this particular item. Um, when you begin your testimony, please state your name and address and whether you oppose or in support of the item. Uh, we're not able, just a reminder, we're not able to display the timer. 
And so Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds, you have two minutes to speak, and she'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining, and we'll also let you know when your time is up, and we appreciate you all recognizing that. Um, so while we uh, wait for the callers to get into the queue, Lisa, how many, any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. Uh, we received one email in opposition prior to the previous meeting. Thank you. Appreciate that. And Sean, do we have any callers for the item? Chairman, we do have um, a caller, so give us just a moment and we'll get them um, placed into the meeting. Thank you very much. And Chairman, you have the first caller. Thank you, and welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman Atkins and the uh, other member of the committee. Uh, my name is Carlos Dance. I live at 3717 Seville Drive in Hermitage. Uh, that uh, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that I oppose the, the uh the development so much as I have a concern. Uh, my property uh, abuts this development at the far southeast corner. Uh, I live at the very end of Seville Drive um, on the north side. Uh, my concern is uh, there used to be a fence row all along there, and there's some huge trees all along that line, that uh, which would be the southern line of the development. Uh, I own the corner, the very corner, very southeast corner. And uh, I have a tree, one specific tree in that I've applied with the uh, Metro Beautification Committee to have designated as a historic and specimen tree. It's a huge black cherry. It's nine, nine feet in circumference. And it's, uh, it's basically beautiful. It's one of the largest trees in the entire area. I've also got several other black cherries and assorted other large trees back there, as do my neighbors. And uh, I'm, I'm simply asking that the developer take special care in that corner, if at all possible, in order to not damage that tree. Uh, uh, the trunks are on my property. I'm 99% sure of that. I went out there and, and checked the stops. Uh, the trunks are actually on my property. I'm almost sure. But uh, um, I would just ask the developer, just uh, out of pure kindness and, uh, to, and, and uh, you know, as a nod to the environment, to, uh, to please take care in that, particularly in that corner, as uh, Caller, you have 30 seconds. And uh, that's uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. I appreciate you all listening to me, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. Any other callers? Chair, we have no other callers currently in the queue, so we'll take a brief pause, and I'll check back in with you. Thank you. Chairman, this is Sean at the call center. We have no other callers in the queue for this item. Thank you. And so the applicant, uh, you have a two minute rebuttal. Okay, I don't need that long. Um, I will, I'll reach out to Mr. Dance. We're, we are required to have a landscape buffer on that property line anyway, as part of the conditions of our SP. Um, I know the exact tree he's talking about. Um, where we have the curve for our um, driveway down there, it stays off of that tree, but we will take every bit of care to save that tree. It's it's worth saving and it's it's an asset to our development as well. Okay, thank you. And I didn't see the council member, council member Roten. Director, have you seen council member Roten on the line? So 
So seeing no one else, let's make sure. Uh, Director, did you see Councilman Roten on the line? I didn't see. Hi, Chairman. This is Lisa with planning. Um, I do not see Councilman Roten on the line. Okay. I just want to make sure. Thank you, Lisa. And so with seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so now we are on to discussion and it sounds like the developer and um, uh, the person calling in uh, are on the same page. But uh, instead of you know, with this many items on public hearing, let's try to, you know, I always definitely want all the commissioners to speak, but we can try again to see if there is um, any more discussion on this item instead of calling uh, individually. So we'll open it up. Is there any discussion? You'll raise your icon hand. I don't see any. So let's try to make a motion and then we'll, we'll see if anyone else wants to speak. So if the, Commissioner Gobble. Uh, I move approval of staff's recommendation. On item 18, thank you. It's a proper motion. And Commissioner Haynes. Second. That's a proper second. Any other discussion? If you'll raise your icon hand or state that you want to speak. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it. And item 18 is approved. So we are on now on to item number 19. And Chairman, this is Sean Shepard at the call center. I'm sorry to interject, um, but I wanted to let you know that Director Kemp has um, indicated she can hear us, but I don't think that we can hear her. So she's going to log out very quickly and log back in um, to try to correct that issue. Um, so I just wanted to make everyone aware that that's happening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll get the director back online. Okay, I appreciate it, Sean. Let me know. Let us know. So we are ready for item number 19. And I think Mr. Swaggart is going to do this one. Jason, you on the line? I see him. He's just muted. Mr. Swagger, are you? Jason, this is Sean Shepard at the call. You got you it. <laughs> okay, this is Jason Swagger. I will be presenting item 19. This is a request for a periodic review for of a plan unit development. Uh, two slides, please. Staff recommends that the development be found inactive and that council that the council approved plan be maintained. Next slide. The site requested for review is only a portion of the plan unit development. This slide identifies the area requested for review and is highlighted. The red line represents the overall boundary of the plan unit development. Next slide. This is the council approved plan. It was approved in 1976 for approximately 38,000 square feet of commercial uses. The portion of the development requested for periodic review is outlined in red. While the request is only for a portion of the plan unit development, staff is recommending that the commission consider the entire development. This is due to the fact that the remaining portion of the development not requested for, re for review is dependent on the subject site. Next slide. This slide includes the plan for an application to revise the portion of the development under review. This application was received prior to the periodic review request. While the request to revise the development was submitted prior to this request, no further action on the revision can take place until the per periodic review process is complete. Next slide. The Planning Commission's role is to determine if the development is active. If the Commission finds that it is active, then no further action is required. If it is determined to be inactive, the Commission is required to take an additional step. The Commission must make a recommendation to Council as to what to do with the inactive development. 
The options are to maintain the approved plan, amend the approved plan, or cancel the approved plan. It also may be necessary for the commission to recommend a zone change. It is important to note that this is time sensitive and the planning commission must hold a public hearing and make a decision within 90 days. This is the last meeting for this deadline. If the commission does not make an action tonight, then the development is automatically considered active. Next slide. This slide includes the criteria for the commission to consider for determining inactivity. First, it has been more than six years since the plan was adopted by council. In this case, it has been approximately 44 years since the last council action. Second, no on-site construction has begun. Staff is not aware of any on-site construction. Finally, right-of-way has not been acquired or off-site improvements have been made as required by council. Staff is not aware of any right-of-way dedications or off-site improvements associated with the development. The, the commission also has the option to consider an aggregate of actions taken within the last 12 months to develop the portion of the planning development under review. Other than the application that was submitted to revise the portion of the development, no further movement has been presented to staff. Next slide. Given the information at hand, staff finds that the development is inactive. As stated previously, if the commission concurs with staff findings, then the commission must make a recommendation to council to maintain, amend, or cancel the development. The commission may also take, may make a recommendation to rezone. The recommendation of what to do with the development under review, if found to be inactive, is based on land use policy as well as any applicable specific redevelopment plans such as historic overlays. Next slide. The development is in the Parkwood Union Hill Community Plan. The policies are suburban neighborhood center and conservation. The suburban neighborhood center policy supports a mixture of residential and non-residential uses. The conservation policy that applies to a portion of the site applies to streams and associated floodplains. Next slide. Staff finds that the approved plan is consistent with the two policies. It permits commercial uses consistent with the policy. Both Old Hickory Boulevard and Brick Church Pike are classified as arterial, and Old Hickory Boulevard is a bus route. These conditions make the site ideal for retail as well as other non-residential uses and higher density residential. While the approved plan identifies development in areas that are now considered floodplain, any future development plans must meet current stormwater regulations. Next slide. In conclusion, staff is recommending that the plan unit development be found inactive and that the commission recommend that council maintain the currently approved plan as it is consistent with the Parkwood Union Hill community plan. Also keep in mind that while the request is for a portion of the development, staff recommends that the commission consider the entire development and is a condition of staff's recommendation. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. And so I believe that this has been requested by the council member, but the applicant is potentially on the line as well, maybe. Is she, uh, Sean, is the applicant on the line? Chair, uh, the applicant for this item is council member Gamble, um, who is okay. on the call. So you can recognize her directly. Excellent. So, Council Lady, you're, you spoke a little bit, I believe, earlier on this particular item. Anything you want to add? Yes, thank you, Chair. And I, I totally agree and appreciate the staff's uh, review of this uh, commercial PUD. It, it, I've had actually several meetings, uh, community meetings about this. The first one was on July 16th, and we had a, a, a pretty good turnout, about 50 people on a virtual meeting to discuss initially the application uh, from um, a developer wanting to develop on the property. Uh, it was at that time that I learned that the uh, PUD on the on the property was um, 45, 44 years old. And, and at that point, uh, after hearing from uh, neighbors, uh, their concerns about commercial development, there are residential um, homes all around this property. I guess it's about seven acres. And, and so to the north, to the south, and to the, uh, I guess, west of the property are residential homes. Uh, to the south of the property is a church, or maybe to the east, I'm sorry, to the east of the property is a church 
uh, that has has been there quite a while. So the the neighbors or, or the community um, appreciates the idea of keeping it uh, in a in a zoning that is that is consistent with the with the T3 uh, neighborhood policy uh, in allowing uh, low intensity. Uh, retail and and office use and even re and even residential, but there was a lot of concern about a uh, higher density commercial use on that property, being that it, it abuts uh, residential communities on on three sides. Only side it doesn't have a residential community is on the uh, south side, which is Old Hickory Boulevard. Um, that separates that from the uh, residential on the other side of, of Old Hickory Boulevard. So uh, I do appreciate that the staff recommends a full a review of the full PUD and not just a portion of the PUD that an application was made on for development uh, because in that full PUD also is a cemetery, a family cemetery, the Tally Family Center Cemetery that has been there Oh, I don't even know how many years, uh, longer than the PUD has been there, uh, that uh, I don't think it was a part of the initial applicant's development. However, it is on the property and we are, I am pursuing um, getting a national or historical, uh, I have reached out to the historical commission about seeing about getting a, that uh, cemetery on the historical register so that it is not, not disturbed. So. Uh, I guess in addition to the, the, after the first meeting, we had a second meeting on September 29th where Mr. Swagger came and talked to the uh, neighbors about the PUD review and the staff's findings of the review. Uh, that was the same night as the first presidential debate. So we didn't have that many uh, residents on that on that call, only about 10 compared to the first, uh, first meeting. However, uh, since then, I've communicated with the community, kept them up to date on the, the uh, staff's recommendation through uh, newsletters, one in July and then one uh, this month in October, and, and also informed them about this meeting today. Not sure if anyone is called in uh, to express their uh, views on, on the PUD review, but I, I think at this point, if, if we can not... Um, redo the PUD as is, that would be the most, um, uh, I guess, productive or effective way to keep the, uh, stay within the T3 neighborhood center policy, but uh, rezone the property uh, using the MUNA uh, rezoning to, to allow low intensity retail uh, because there is a desire for coffee shops, uh, retail shops, and office space, uh, but not just the big commercial development that the current bud would allow. Thank you, Council. Yes. So we'll, we're about ready to go into the portion where we take callers, and then at the very end, I'll make sure that you have the final say. So we appreciate you calling in. Thank you. So now we are ready to take calls from members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show the call in number now. So if you would call in and you do not need to wait uh, on this particular item. So it's item number 19. Uh, you'll be placed into a queue um, and then you'll have two minutes to, when you recognize you have two minutes to speak. Uh, there's not a visible timer. So Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds. Uh, left of your time and then let you know when the two minutes has finished. Um, we appreciate everybody calling in. Um, but before we get to the callers, Lisa, do we have any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. Uh, this is Lisa. We did not receive any emails on this item. Okay. Thank you. And so now we are ready to take callers. Sean, are there any callers in the queue? Chair, we do have a caller on the line, but we're trying to get clarification on whether this is their item of interest. Um, so we're gonna okay. um, bear with us just a moment and I'll check back in. Thank you.
Chair, this is Sean Shepard at the call center. The caller that we have on the line is um, not wishing to speak on this item. Um, so we do not have any callers in the queue for this item. Okay. Thank you very much, Sean. And so um, seeing nobody else, no one in the call, Council Lady, any other thing you want to say before we close the public hearing? Um, I think that's all. I, I just would like to also uh, say that the staff recommended uh, that if you either the reapproval or the PUD or the rezoning of the mixed use uh, neighborhood. And uh, I, I appreciate them for looking at uh, another option in addressing uh, the concerns that were shared uh, from the community during our community meeting. Okay, thank you, Councilor And seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll uh, declare the public hearing closed. And so with no one calling in opposition, let's try this again with the commissioners. Uh, is there any discussion? If you'll raise your icon hand. Hi, Chairman, this is uh, Lisa. I did want to make sure that um, under the staff recommendation, we had recommended a couple of options. One would be to reapprove the PUD or to rezone. And so the commission would need to be clear on which of those two they were doing. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. That's good. And I see some discussion. So, um, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman Atkins. Uh, uh, we'd like to thank uh, input from Council Lady Gamble. And uh, I think it is so clear this part is inactive. Uh, it meets all the criteria. So as for the recommendation, considering uh, all the neighborhood and the policy, I agree with uh, Council Lady Gamble's input instead of reapproving old pod a PUD, which is commercial only, I think MUNA will be appropriate. So that will give not only commercial retail office usage, but also residential. So it would be great opportunity to do uh, live work development in that uh, particular section uh, would be a, a great transition from uh, neighborhood center to conservation and then surrounded by uh, all the existing uh, residential zoning. So uh, I am in favor of uh, recognizing a part is inactive and recommendation will be uh, instead of reapproving a current uh, a PUD, uh, rezone to MUNA. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Murphy. Thank you. I just wanted to um, acknowledge and point out and thank the councilwoman for, for this is one of those where a lot of times PUD revisions or, or revisiting, deciding if a PUD is active or inactive, we're usually after the fact um, and the community wants a change, but but the PUD has been active and we are in a position where we can't find it inactive. And so clearly this is an example where, as the council lady stated, it's an outdated PUD. The community would like something different. And so I'm glad that we are able to do something positive instead of being in the situation where we have to let neighbors down because we have to find something active. And so I think this is a great example um, of being proactive in zoning um, and what is is there. And so I appreciate Council Lady Gamble bringing it to us and giving us this opportunity to help make her community a little better with her. Excellent, thank you. Any other discussion? So now we'll need a motion and the, uh, you wanna make a motion, Council Lady? Sure, sure. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. You said council no, lady. No. Yeah, I, did. I, I meant uh, council lady Murphy. I'm okay, sorry. I'm sorry. We, 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 yeah, you're fine. I'm, look, I'm excited. No, this is good. You're doing great work here. So, uh, how about council, council lady Murphy? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I move that we found the that we find the PUD inactive, um, and and. I guess at this time, do I need to add in a, a the zoning part, or should that be a separate motion? Yes, let's let's do it. I think it's appropriate to do it together. 
Okay, then um, I guess I guess I'm just going to read the sacrament that we find it in active and recommend council property. It tells me that's not the motion Two. I need to make. Well, let's check with Lisa to make sure we can combine the motions first. Let's make sure that Lisa is set. Sure. Hi, Chairman. So the way that this works is that you all, I would probably make a recommendation first on the activity or the inactivity, um, okay. just to keep it clear. And then I would make a second motion to say that you all recommend that a, a rezoning be considered for MUNA. Now, what will happen is that because it would be a rezoning, we would then have a separate application that would come back to you all so that it can go through the proper notification process for a rezoning. Um, so these, the process on these is a little bit different, um, but I would make the motion for the inactivity first, and then I would make a second motion that the Planning Commission consider a rezoning, and then you'll see that application in the very near future. Thank you. So, Council Lady, make the motion. Let's separate the two motions, if you would. Okay, so first I'm just going to move that we find the PUD inactive. That's a proper motion. And is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Johnson, you want a second? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I second the motion. That's a proper motion and second. Any discussion, if you would raise your icon hands or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are ready for uh, the motion to declare the PUD inactive. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. And ayes have it, and the PUD is inactive. Council Lady Murphy, you want to make the second motion? Yes, I would. I would move to reconsider, or I'm sorry, move that we rezone to MUNA be considered. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Johnson. I second the motion. That's a proper second. Any discussion, if you'd raise your icon hands. Is, or verbally state you want to discuss. Seeing no other discussion, we are on a roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Comm uh, Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it. And it is. As Lisa said, we're going to consider N U N A. Now we are on to that completes item 19. So now we are on to item 20. Chairman, this is Lucy. I just wanted to see if my sound was working. Now I apologize for doing a check in the middle of the meeting. Hey, welcome back. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Carry on. Right. Okay. Great. <laughs> I think item 20 is Logan. Yes, Chair, thank you. My name is Logan Elliott, and I will be presenting item 20 on behalf of the Planning Department. Next slide, please. The request is to modify the Villages of Riverwood Urban Design Overlay District to change the permitted land use from 776 assisted living units to 210 multifamily residential units. Next slide, please. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next slide, please. The site is zoned RM9, which permits nine units an acre. Additionally, the subject site is a part of the Villages of Riverwood Urban Design Overlay District and was included in the 2004 master plan. 
urban design overlay districts apply an additional layer of regulation to properties and are intended to allow for the application and implementation of special design standards. The land use is still governed by the base zoning district of RM9 and the UDO applies unique design standards. Next slide, please. The policy for this site is suburban neighborhood evolving open space and conservation policy the suburban neighborhood evolving policy aims to create an enhanced suburban neighborhood with greater housing choice, improved connectivity, and more creative, innovative, and environmentally sensitive development techniques. The intent of the open space policy is to preserve and enhance existing open space areas, most of which are publicly owned parks and greenways. The open space policy here recognizes a planned greenway following New Stones River. The conservation policy intends to keep undisturbed environmentally sensitive land features in a natural state, and the conservation policy here recognizes streams and significant slopes. Next slide, please. Here we see the master plan for the villages of Riverwood UDO as approved in 2004. The subject site for today's consideration is section M, circled in red at the bottom of the screen. The Villages of Riverwood UDO was approved to allow for the development of 1,978 residential units, 45,000 square feet of mixed-use commercial, and two Type B billboards. The total site area is approximately 220 acres. The subject site today, Section M, is approximately 23 acres and was approved for 776 units of assisted living facility. Next slide, please. Here we see an aerial of the site adjacent to the Stones River and I-40. Next slide, please. The application proposes to modify the UDO by replacing the 776 units of assisted living facility that are currently approved for this portion of the UDO to 210 multifamily residential units. The proposed plan establishes an additional building typology in the overall UDO master plan that would be built in the last remaining section of this UDO. The application proposes to establish the design guidelines shown on the screen here and the other regulations in the UDO that are applicable to this specific section would still be in place. The proposed building typology is similar to the attached townhome style unit that has been constructed in the UDO near Hoggett Ford Road. The typologies are very similar, this proposed typology in the existing near Hoggett Ford, other than that the proposed typology would be created in a horizontal property regime rather than platted individual lots. Next slide, please. Here we see the street network plan that was included in the villages of Riverwood UDL. The plan the proposed plan includes a standard that the units near Stonewater Drive are to be oriented towards Stonewater Drive. Stonewater Drive would also be improved to include sidewalks per the standards of the UDO. The proposed standards of Section M would require the 210 townhouse units to be served by private drives with sidewalks. A standard is included requiring that the internal units not fronting or near Stonewater Drive would be oriented towards common courtyards or open space. Also, the plan states that the parking will either be in individual garages or surface parked to the rear of the unit. Compliance with all of these standards would be reviewed for at the time of final site plan application. A review of the proposed multifamily units in comparison to the existing approved assisted living facility units has found that the proposed multifamily units would generate less daily vehicle trips than the currently approved assisted living facility because the anticipated vehicle trips generated from the multifamily units is less than the anticipated vehicle trips generated from the assisted living facility, a traffic study was not required with this application. The Traffic and Parking Division that reviews application has indicated that a traffic study may be required at time of development. Next slide, please. The proposed development is consistent with the intent of the suburban neighborhood evolving policy to provide a diversity of housing options in a suburban form. The units that will be near Stonewater Drive will be oriented to this public street and otherwise 
units will be oriented towards open space or common courtyards, and this is consistent with the neighborhood evolving policy. The site is challenged in contributing to the street network for the area, and the use of private drives for this development is consistent with policy. Additionally, staff is recommending an additional regulating standard to be included that requires the final site plan to avoid the environmentally sensitive areas that are recognized with the conservation policy. This will ensure preservation of the areas recognized as environmentally sensitive. And that completes my presentation, and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, so we'll open item 20 for public hearing. And Thank you. I want to see if Sean is the um, applicant oh. on the line. Chair, you do have um, the applicant on the line, and they're unmuted for you to recognize. All right. Well, welcome. And you have 10 minutes. You can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Appreciate you calling. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Uh, this is Roy Dell, so make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you, Roy. Okay, Go ahead. thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Planning Director, and staff. I'm Roy Dell with Dell & Associates. I'm speaking on behalf of the property owner. When this 220-acre UDO was proposed and approved, the UDO was designed to include a mixture of uses. 411 single-family homes, 291 single-family townhouses, 500 multifamily apartments, and a six-story, 776-unit assisted living, which is actually 2,328 beds, plus 20,000 square feet of accessory commercial uses. As Villages of Riverwood has developed, it's felt that a six-story assisted living facility is really out of character for this neighborhood that consists of mainly three-story houses. Uh, it should be noted that the facility would have a minimum of 776 parking spaces when combined with emergency vehicles would generate a high level of traffic within this residential neighborhood. It is felt that it would be most beneficial to the community to modify the currently RM Zone 9 property from the assisted living to 210 single family townhouse units as similar to other sections of Riverwood. I've talked to many of the neighbors many of whom think this is a zone change request, so I think there's some confusion about that. Uh, but, however, the universal concerns, as always, traffic, stormwater, loss of open space, value of homes, all of which are actually minimized by the modification of this UDO. This proposal has much less impact than a six-story mid-rise assisted living facility. There'll be less impervious surface by the reduction of 776 parking spaces, Proposed homes will front onto open space. Conditions are being added that don't currently exist that basically place protection factors in for environmentally sensitive areas. So it's not a zone change. It is a modification to the UDO in order to allow a less impactive development that blends in with the neighborhood. And I'm here to answer any questions uh, if they come up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And you have two minutes for a rebuttal. And so now we are ready to take calls from members of the public who wish to call yeah. in. Your screen should show the call in number. So please call in now. You don't have to wait <clears throat> until the other speakers are finished because we'll place you in a queue. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address and if you're for or opposed to the project. And as a reminder, please only call in on this current case, which is case number 20. And there is no uh, timer, visible timer, so Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds left and when your time is finished. So we, so please call in. Now, Lisa, any emails? Hi, Chairman. We received 24 emails in opposition. Thank you very much. And so, Sean, we are now ready to hear testimony from the caller. Sean, anyone on the line? Chairman, we do have callers, so we'll get the first one queued up, and I'll let you know when we have them in the meeting. Thank you.
Kevin, you have the first caller. Hi, my name is Kevin Forney. I live at 2057 Hickory Brook Drive. Well, my concern with this whole project is that as I look at the uh, map that's up on, on this, I guess the slide that's up now, it shows three, three lanes flowing into this. Um, and the traffic as you come down um, Hickory Brook, it's a descent into that area. And as you come up our driveway and you get to the stop sign, you can't see up the hill. If there are cars parked on either side, which there is parking allowed on the street, there is not enough room for cars to pass in that. So I don't see how adding more traffic, more housing into this development is the wise thing to do. I understand about the argument there were 776 assisted living uh, units that were available, but the truth of the matter is generally if people are in assisted living, they don't drive that much. So I think that is a false pretense that somebody's trying to plow saying, oh, this will relieve pressure, which I don't think will come. Also what's not addressed is when you look at section M, that that was originally going to be houses and now it's three level apartments that have built, been built in that section. So there continues to be a stress on the electricity grid, on police, on fire departments, and nothing has been addressed by that. So I would remain in opposition to this. I don't see the And I also believe that, you know, where I'm from, I'm originally from Southern Indiana, and when I see where that, um, I would say the exit from Percy Priest is, that's almost flood prone. You're about 20 meters from that area when it becomes high. So I really don't see the idea of building in a flood zone. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Thank you. And you have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Thank you for calling in. Thank you. Um, hello, commissioners. Thank you for your service to our community and for this opportunity to address you today. My name is Heather Smith, and I live in the Villages of Riverwood neighborhood at 2580 River Trail Drive. Um, I volunteered to uh, construct a survey for resident concerns, and then I used uh, qualitative research methods to code and report those concerns. So while there was maybe 24 emails, that survey represents over 76 responses in one email. So I want to draw that, uh, your attention to that. And I'm happy to answer any questions related to that survey. Um, and I would like to use the remainder of my time to speak personally in opposition. Um, I believe it's been 16 years since the original urban design overlay approval for an assisted living community, and um, there's been tremendous single-family and multifamily development in the surrounding areas during those 16 years. I would really like to see a reconsideration of the impact upon current residents, um, particularly Access Roads, Dodson Chapel. I believe you just heard a, a few items ago about another project on this road. Um, and those roads have remained largely un unchanged during those 16 years. And the traffic is uh, largely from single family, multifamily, um, you know, accessing to the interstate and so forth. Um, and I agree with the previous caller that traffic patterns in a system living facility are, are different than a multifamily development. So I'd like reconsideration. Oh, you have 30 seconds. Okay. And I checked with our community manager, and these folks would not pay HOA fees. They're technically not part of the villages of Riverwood community. And yet they would drive through and through where we pay for water feature and landscaping. And, um, you know, uh, you know they, but they wouldn't be part of the villages of Riverwood community. And lastly, it's not just concerned with loss of open space. As you saw in that aerial view. All of your time is up. Please street. finish your thoughts. So there's already noise from the interstate and loss of trees and further 
you know, I think that a lot of people work from home, and so already there's uh, there's noise from the interstate. So I just ask you for, we don't really know how to proceed. We're all private residents here, but we um, appreciate your... Caller, you're... Yep. <laughs> Next caller, sure. Okay. Chairman, you have the next caller. All right. Welcome, and uh, you have two minutes. You may begin. My name is Rusty Howard. We live at 1980 Stonewater in the Riverwood Village. My comment uh, with regard to this, this hearing is that we anticipated the uh, large open area to be assisted living when we bought the place. And it's just a little bit uncomfortable to hear it being reshifted or shifted again. The one thing that I really can, was concerned about was where will this area dump all of its traffic? And I assumed that it would be onto Dodson Chapel, but as it looks like it's laid out, it would be coming out on Stonewater. You're very garbled. Am I correct in assuming there is no exit onto Dodson Chapel? Uh, sir, this is your time to testify. We'll we'll get to the details of that in our testimony. Okay. So, well, you heard my my comment. Is that is that it? <laughs> Lisa, can you explain? Well, again, I'm just asking about where the traffic will be have egress onto Dodson Chapel or onto Stonewater. Sir, will we please uh, will we please to answer all the questions in the Q and A section of the hearing? We just want to get to you at this point. Thank you. The uh, your response is so garbled, I can't understand it. Sir, we will we'll get we will answer the your question when after the public hearing is over. Okay, fine. That's that's all. I, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Thank you, and welcome to the call. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Paul Pawarczyk, and I live at 2829 White Birch Drive, which is uh, maybe uh, 450 feet uh, just above uh, Stonewater Drive, and where you're uh, planning on putting this other community in. The uh, infrastructure in the villages of Riverwood, uh, especially on Stonewater Drive, isn't uh, in any shape that would be able to have an act, an entrance placed on it that would accept at least another 210 cars since there's going to be 210 townhouses or 210 homes built there. And I don't believe Dotson Chapel Road has got the capability to handle all those extra cars with the current town and the current apartment places that are being built there right off of Dotson Chapel. Bell Road isn't sufficient enough to have uh, uh, all that traffic going over it over the dam. So I'm thinking that uh, if uh, th we ought to just say, no, we don't need this development here anymore because it's already overpopulated, or if you decide to, to go through and let this development exist, then uh, the only way that uh, the residents of the development ought to have, should have access to their homes is through Dotson Chapel, because uh, the villages of Riverwood infrastructure is incapable of handling all this extra traffic. And that's all I've got to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. 
Thank you. Welcome. And uh, please state your name and address, and you have two minutes. My name is Laurie Thompson, and my address is 1681 Stonewater Drive in the Riverwood community, and I'm definitely calling to oppose this. In the 16 years since the original application was made, so much has changed in the neighborhood. As it stands now, there are exactly two egress points for 1,700 homes, and there is an abundance of traffic on both Stonewater Drive and Dudson Chapel. Permission was given to build so many buildings along these roads, and the roads are very narrow, and there is great concern about getting emergency vehicles to the new location and past the new location. We also pay HOA fees for the development, for the water feature, for the sidewalks that are there, and there's not going to be anybody from these new homes participating in maintaining these. We've already got Metro, which has oh, very thankfully connected 300 apartments right behind my home to our facilities and our walking trails. Thanks. The proposed properties would devalue our neighborhood homes, and there's no green space included in this new construction, none. The builder is already building in the neighborhood and is extremely disrespectful, allowing construction employees to urinate in public, work outside of legal hours, and they have drawn the construction out to almost three years. In fact, the land currently under construction more closely resembles a quarry for almost a year, with 18 to 20 dump trucks continually on site, moving rock in and out, blasting and noise. The noise and dirt well, is above what a normal neighborhood would allow an individual living in the neighborhood. Your job is to protect our property, including the value of our property, and the only reason I can see that you would approve this is to allow the builder to make more money. It's not needed. It's not safe. It's a drain on the resources. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, next caller. Chair, you have the next caller. Welcome. You have two minutes, and please state your name and address. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the time. My name is Samantha Forney. I live at 1300 River Birch Way. Uh, very close to this development. I believe that most of my neighbors have already brought up um, all of the points that I wanted to make, but um, the, the one thing that sticks out to me is definitely claiming that um, the assisted living home was not consistent with the current neighborhood. I would argue that an assisted living home would be uh, much more uh, representative of our neighborhood versus apartments. There are no apartments currently in the development. Um, additionally, some other folks have talked about them not paying HOA fees, um, and, and that's a big concern. I moved to the development in 2017, um, and I do have plans to uh, grow a family there. Um, I don't feel that this would be a, a safe neighborhood with bringing in some outside um, apartment complexes for people to drive through our neighborhoods and, and not pay any HOA fees. I would much rather prefer to have some some type of green space to add to um, you know the current sidewalks and, and things that we have. So that's all I wanted to say. I do oppose this motion, and I appreciate the time from the committee. Thank you for calling in. Next caller, Sean. Chair, we don't currently have any other callers. Um, we'll take a brief pause because we have had a number, so surely folks have... Um, learn to call in, but we'll call, we'll pause just in case anyone is uh, trying to reach us and I'll check back in. Thank you. Chair, we have no additional callers in the queue for this item. Okay, we're ready for rebuttal. Uh, is the applicant, Mr. Dale, still on the line? I'm still here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to go over a few of the questions. Uh, the intent would be to join the HOA. There is no current builder on this development. Homes do front on open space. There'll be a lot of preservation of open space. 
These are not apartments, they're townhouses, similar, actually the same typology as the townhouses that exist today. This is an entitled piece of property. It is approved for over 2,000 bed uh, assisted living with 776 required parking spaces. This would generate a lot of traffic, much, much, much more traffic than what we're proposing in this modification. It's not in a flood zone, and there's a condition added that we must avoid sensitive areas um, but most universally I think the concerns were infrastructure concerns which I really listen to uh, it's been 16 years since this UDO was put into place a, a road network was established for this and was established for this parcel but I think traffic and parking has added condition I think the duly noted condition that when they come back that they should look at the existing road infrastructure to see if there are things that need to be done and that's something that's added to this UDO, would not be added to the UDO without this modification. So uh, to summarize, the proposed use is much less intent than the existing use, heights of buildings, types of buildings, uh, much less traffic. And by modifying the UDO, you're adding conditions that don't exist today to protect sensitive areas and to actually require an infrastructure. Applicant, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm good. So um, I greatly appreciate your time and consideration. If you have any questions, I'll be hanging out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And is the council member, I don't think the council member is on the line. He is not, sir. No, I have not seen Councilman Roten. Okay, so seeing uh, no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so now we are on to uh, discussion. Commissioner Gobble. Well, I, I certainly hear all the neighbors and I'm familiar with Dobson Chapel Road and how it is a congested area out there. Uh, it does seem like this is really gonna be less of an issue uh, in the area, and it kind of makes sense, but I'm going to listen to the other uh, commissioners and see what they have to say. All right, Commissioner Haynes. Um, I understand why the neighbors uh, are resisting multifamily, but having successfully integrated multifamily uh, along with single family housing and other projects, I think it can work. I think it can work very well to have a variety of housing stocks. I think this is actually a good thing to go from the significant number of assisted living units down to a lower number of multifamily units. So I'm going to support staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I totally understand you know, how and why neighbors expressed uh, their concerns and so forth. I totally uh, sympathize. But um, so this is already approved for uh, assisted living up to uh, 776 units. And the change proposed is 210 units. Um, so I wonder if staff or if we have public works uh, uh, online to kind of explain uh, the traffic analysis, you know, in the staff report under the assisted living scenario, uh, the daily trips will be uh, 6,053 and while um, multifamily residential unit, uh, 210 unit, will be reduced to 1,547 uh, daily trips a uh, weekday. So could you uh, confirm, you know, wh what's the uh, rationale or reasoning for that? And then I might have additional question. And who? Yeah, either staff or uh, public works person can uh, talk about that traffic count. 
Sure, right. just a moment. Lisa or Sean, um, is Public Works on the line? I can't, I'm scrolling through. They, they're probably not promoted. Um, Hi, Luke. Hi, Lucy. We do have someone from Public Works on the line. Okay, can we promote them so they're able to answer the commissioner's question? This is Sean Bogosian from Public Works. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so to answer the question about, am I understanding that you're asking how did we determine the, the, the expected trip generation based off the land uses? Yes, that is correct. Uh, changing from our uh, current assisted living uh, to uh, from assisted living, then uh, to multifamily residential. Sure. So we uh, Public Works utilizes a nationally recognized um, database uh, from the Institute of Transportation Engineers um, that has conducted studies for the for the past 20, 30 years. Um, to determine anticipated trip generation results based off land uses. And so we utilize that, that database to determine the anticipated trip generation um, for the assisted living based off unit count, based off proposed beds, and compare that to the anticipated trip generation based off the multifamily. And it was determined that it would be a reduction of about 4,500 daily trips. Thank you so much. It is uh, yeah, greatly helpful. I appreciate that information. Uh, so looking at uh, original uh, UDO, I think I I'm confirming with the uh, staff uh, person this time. So the street connection is, uh, I believe it's connected to uh, Stormwater Drive. So that's the original. And uh, this one is not really changing the entire uh, master plan of UD UDO. So still uh, section M, either assisted living or uh, motor housing still connected to uh, Stormwater Drive. Is that correct? Hi, Commissioner, this is Logan Elliott with the Planning Department again. Um, to touch on the access, this specific site would be accessed by Stonewater Drive. That's not being changed with the requested application. And I think just to kind of clarify the overall circulation of the, the development, Stonewater Drive, um, the, the plan is oriented pretty close to True North being the top of the plan. So at the south of the plan, we have the subject site and you would travel north on Stonewater Drive up to either Riverwood Village Boulevard to go east to Dodson Chapel Road or continue north all the way to Hoggett Ford Road and go east to get to Dodson Chapel Road. But Stonewater Drive would be the primary access for this specific site. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. Uh, uh, yes, so as much as I sympathize with the neighbors and I don't want to see open space turning into a uh, future uh, multifamily residential, I understand it, but if we don't accept the change, uh, current plan will be uh, assisted living uh, up to 776 units. So considering uh, the location, and uh, policy, I will um, agreement with the staff recommendation. One thing I would like to make it sure is on the body of a staff report, it says uh, staff is recommending additional regulating standard be included that requires uh, the final site plan to be to avoid environmentally sensitive area that are uh, recognized. Uh, while 
conservation uh, with within the conservation policy. And I do appreciate the recommendation, but I have not seen that in the very bottom at last as a condition. So I would like to see those specific to be included uh, in a condition so we wouldn't have any uh, miscommunication and misunderstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you. There does seem to be a lot of questions and concerns from the community. Um, could staff let me know if there was, was there a community meeting on this one? Can you remind me of that and how many community meetings? Yes, council member Murphy, this is Logan Elliott with the planning department again. Uh, a community meeting was not required with this application, so I'm not sure if the applicant elected to hold a community meeting. So I might say, uh, suggest asking the applicant. Sean, let's, um, yeah, let's yeah, get. Yeah, that'd be great if the applicant could answer if there was a community meeting held. Okay, uh, this is Roy Dell again. There was a multimedia that was provided. Links were provided to that. I've talked to a lot of the neighbors as well. I've talked to the council member as well. Uh, I think that this adequately notified, but as, you, as you've heard from the um, testimony, it's really more of, in, of an infrastructure issue, which I think staff has got in their conditions. Thank you. Okay, the reason I was asking about a community meeting is because that's where a lot of, um, in my experience, you know, if there is misinformation um, or, clarifications needed as to what the existing rights are, because I think there is some misunderstanding of whether this is a zone change or not, or whether this is increasing or decreasing entitlements of the existing zoning and UDO. Um, and that's also the benefit of community meetings is where the community can give input to the developer. And hopefully, um, if things go the way that we all hope they go, um, the developer adjusts their plans um, based off feedback in a positive way. Um, and so, so I, it, I'm not sure how much of that give and take really happened here. Um, I understand it, it can be very frustrating to have a community like this built out and then having a, a pocket of it um, built out much later. Um, it, it is concerning um, that this switch would change this late in the game, but I do understand looking at the looking at the traffic count, it is a huge decrease in in traffic, which is surprising to me. Um, of course, we don't know necessarily how many beds per unit or bedrooms per unit there will be per per um, of the two hundred and ten townhomes or, or flats or what have you. And so, I mean, I would have liked to see a little bit more engagement on the community part and the give take and, and that dialogue happen. Um, and that's disappointing that it hasn't happened. Um, but I'll listen to everyone else's comments. Thank you. Commissioner Sims. <laughs> I want to thank Commissioner Murphy. That's exactly where I was going with this thing. I know that part of our job is to get deep in the weeds with all the policies, but our core principles really state that neighborhoods are the city's identity and its vitality for the future. And the fact that there was no community meeting, I think is what happens is we have somewhere between 76 and 100 comments in writing, depending on how Ms. Smith's qualitative research actually is counted. I'm not sure if she has a duplicated count in there or not. So that's a lot of emails coming to us. And our code of ethics says that we not only will have public hearings, we will actually hear the public. And they're asking a lot of legitimate questions, I think concerning the quality of life they have, as well as really the uh, impact that this change, however minimal it may actually be, and it may actually be on the good side, but they have genuine questions. And I think that I know that I read a recent article by the Municipal Institute for Research and Scholarship for Planners, and it tells us that the most important thing we can do as planners is, uh, particularly as commissioners, is to encourage the public to actually be heard, not just by us, but by the city. 
some disappointed as is as is uh, Councilwoman Murphy, and I would like to see that meeting actually held and a discussion so that that well-being of the community can continue. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Tibbs. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm actually um, kind of appreciate the kind of the way the conversation's going. You, uh, I think I'll just say philosophically, I, I don't disagree with the approach the developer is taking as regards to how they're developing it. Um, but, uh, you know, to um, Commissioner Sims and Councilor Murphy's um, point, this is large, this is a lot. And um, you would like to have seen some real thoughtful engagement with the community because, um, you know, we all want to know when something like this is is coming into our neighborhood. And um, actually, I, I believe that um, the way um, uh, Mr. Dale represented it, I think there probably could be some good answers to a lot of their questions. But uh, I, I feel like that we'd be a little... Um, you know, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't allow that process to happen. Um, I don't necessarily have any real negative thoughts about it, only in the fact, though, that for this large community to kind of be left in the dark doesn't really seem uh, kind of consistent with some of the things that we typically do. Thank you, Commissioner. And... So now we, we're still in discussion, uh, and but we we need um, we'll need a, a motion unless there's other discussion. So if you would Council raise your Murphy, I have my hand raised. Oh, here, I thought, Council lady, I think. Council lady, um, yes, perfect. Thank you. I would like to, um, if we can, I'd like to 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 have to make a motion that we require a community meeting um, and defer this um, and until that happens. My reasoning is is that before UDOs go into place, there is a lot of community input, and it sounds like this UDO is not a new UDO, so that community input. Um, has, has not really happened for this phase. And for a change like this, I, I just think that a community meeting would not only answer questions, but hopefully give everybody a little more peace of mind of what's going on and some helpful feedback for the developer um, and some helpful feedback for us if it, if and when it comes before us again. And so with that, I'd like to defer until a community meeting is held. Well, so we, let's ask that generally we, you know, we'll, we would procedurally either do like a, a specific deferral, like one meeting deferral or defer indefinitely. And so generally, uh, let's ask the, the director uh, what her thoughts are. Sure. Um, so, you know, the commission will at times um, defer usually for uh, a meeting or two. Uh, so that a community meeting can occur. Lisa, can you just confirm procedurally that this, this approval, it's not a change in entitlements, and so it does not go to council, uh, correct? And so we're not working under that time frame. Lisa, can you confirm? Well, I can't hear Lisa. Um, so, I can't hear her. Okay, yeah, this, so I think what I would, okay. I was this is Bob. Muted. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was double muted. I'm here now. I was giving a very eloquent explanation. Um, this is Lisa with <laughs> Um Yes, that's correct. This is not a change in entitlement. Um, the base zoning for UDO is what controls the actual permitted uses. In this case, RM9, which permits um, the multifamily units as proposed. Um, because this is not a change in entitlements, um, it does not require council approval. Okay, so and then Chairman, I think I think if the commission wanted to entertain a deferral, then um, we, we have a little more uh, flexibility in terms of the timing. So I, I think what I would 
you know, suggest is, um, you know, a two meeting deferral or something to that effect to give time to notice and, and coordinate with the council member and the like, and we'll place it on an agenda. And if for some reason the community meeting isn't able to happen, we can address it at that point. Okay, so uh, Council Lady, how about, would you feel good about a two meeting deferral? And, I and think that with, would, that should be enough With the request to... of, you know, yes. having a public meeting, okay. Ye yes, Chairman, I think that, that that is a reasonable amount of time to hopefully get together something, a community meeting, a Zoom or WebEx meeting. Um, I know this, our council staff put a meeting together for me for next week and in less than a day. So, so hopefully they can find a mutually agreed upon date and get that moving. Um, and, and I think a two meeting deferral should be sufficient. And if not, you know, we, I think we can discuss and entertain what ba uh, barriers there were to that. So with that, I'd, I'd uh, suggest, or I'd move a two meeting deferral with the heavy suggestion of community meeting to the developer. Okay, and is there a second? If you yes, this is Pearl, I'll be glad to second that. Commissioner Sims is, that's a proper second. Any other discussion? If you'd raise your icon hands or verbally state that you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are on a, uh, well, uh, one, one more clarification is that on the um, deferral motion, uh, Council Lady, would you want to open our public hearing back up? I think that would be a good decision. Okay, that's just a clarification on the motion. Any other discussion on the motion? So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we're ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it, and it's deferred two meetings, and we'll reopen the public hearing. We are now on item number 21, and I think that's Anita is going to do that, I think. We have Anita on? Hi, Chairman. Yes, I'm here. I was waiting to be unmuted. Um, okay, hi, Commissioners. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. Anita McKegg, Metro Planning here. I'm presenting item 21, the Gallatin Pike Corridor Design Overlay. Next slide, please. Request is to apply a corridor design overlay for a portion of Gallatin Pike in Madison. We have not received concerns or opposition. This item is being presented to you um, to keep the case on track for the November Council public hearing. Next slide, please. Um, Lisa, can you do the one that says area? The next slide after this one. Thank you. The proposed overlay begins at Briley Parkway and runs north to Anderson Lane. It also includes several side streets, primarily in downtown Madison. The area is three miles in length, contains 327 acres, and portions of three council districts. Next slide, please. These policies, the uses. These policies encourage pedestrian-friendly development that enhances the public realm. Next slide. The area also contains a mix of zoning districts. Next slide. Numerous plans and studies have occurred in Madison over past decades, 11. Last year, area council members asked us to work with them on applying implementation tools. Next slide. Various plans, the same themes and vision were repeated, improve the pike, support travel options, and create a vibrant core. Next slide. We began by analyzing the previous plans. We held a workshop last November in 2019 to ask the community's thoughts on implementation tools. 
the decision was to begin with the corridor overlay. During the past year, property owners have received several rounds of public notices about the process and the proposed overlay. Next slide. The overlay focuses on incremental improvements over time. It does this through standards for signage, landscaping, and building front materials beyond those requirements found in base zoning districts. Next slide. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll open this item for public hearing and Sean is the applicant on the line. We, we are um, the applicant. The there you go. <laughs> oh, we we are the we yes. are the applicant. We recognize this is Lucy. We recognize Nina McGeck here. <laughs> That's right. Excellent. Well, and I I appreciate that. And we'll save uh, two minutes for your, uh, the planning rebuttal. I'm I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so now we we are ready um, to take calls from the members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show the call-in number. Please call in now. You don't need to wait until the next speaker because we will place you into a queue. As I've stated before uh, on the call, tonight you have two minutes. Please state your name and your address and whether you oppose or support the project, and that would be very helpful. Unfortunately, there is no visible timer, so Sean will let you know verbally. Uh, when you have 30 seconds remaining, and then she'll let you know when the time is up. We appreciate everybody um, abiding by our timing rules. And so now um, the question is, Lisa, did we get any um, emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. We did receive uh, seven emails in support. Thank you. And so now we are ready to take callers. Sean, do we have any callers in the queue? Chair, we do not currently have any callers, so we'll take a brief pause in case anyone's trying to reach us, and then we'll check back in. Thank you. And I appreciate everyone keeping me straight uh, as we move on to our almost thir three hours of meeting. Chair, we do have a caller, but we're clarifying which item um, they're wishing to speak on, so bear with us just a moment. Excellent. Thank you. Chair, this is Sean at the call center. Um, that caller was inquiring about the status of the previous item, which we have clarified. We do not have any callers in the queue for this item. Okay. With no other callers, uh, and we are the applicant and the rebuttal, we are now ready for uh, council members. I know that several council members spoke on this item before. And let me see if these council members, let's see here. Would any of those council members like to speak again? So we've got um, council member Benedict, council member Van Rees and council member Hancock. Would it, any of y'all like to speak anymore or did y'all? I don't think any of them want to speak? So let's make sure though. Any council members want to speak? Chair, this is Councilwoman Benedict. I think that based on the feedback that you've received and that Ms. McKegg uh, expressed, I think there is wide public support for this. And um, quite frankly, I've been along for the ride and I really appreciate the work from Council Member Van Rees to uh, get us here. I think this is a great thing for Madison. I believe both of them concur. So rather than taking up any more time, I suspect we are good. Thank you, Councilman. I just want to make sure. I always want to make sure you guys are taken care of. Um, Thank you for that. All right, so uh, we'll, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I uh, declare the public hearing closed. And so um, since there was no opposition, let 
me ask the commissioners if anyone would like to speak or maybe make a motion. Uh, Commissioner Haynes. I'd love to make a motion being a Madison native. I think this is fabulous, especially complicated with three council districts. So I will move approval of staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. Commissioner Tibbs. Second that. Okay, so that's a, we have a proper motion and a proper second. Any discussion? If you would raise your icon hands or verbally state you'd like to speak. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Councilor A. Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. And the ayes have it. And I want to thank the three council members for all their hard work. Thank you for leading it, Council Van Rees. I've always enjoyed working with you. All right, so now we are on to item number 22. Uh, and this is Amelia. Can you guys hear me okay? Hey, Amelia, welcome. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is Amelia Lewis with the planning department presenting item 22 tonight. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. The request is to apply a contextual overlay district for properties along Rose Cliff Drive. Next slide, please. Staff's recommendation is to approve. Next slide, thank you. <laughs> the properties are located along Rose Cliff Drive, east of Preston Drive. Um, the properties that we are talking about in this overlay tonight are shaded in dark gray on the screen. Um, the zoning of these properties is one and two family residential, R10. Um, as you can see, is similar zoning for the surrounding properties. Um, the zoning would remain with the same, um, would remain the same, um, and the overlay would be applied to provide additional development standards to maintain the character of the neighborhood. I believe the council member mentioned in her opening comments that this. Um, this overlay would be adjacent to a previously approved contextual overlay, which is shown in the light gray and the black outline um, on the screen. And again, the ones that we are looking at tonight um, is the larger area and the dark gray. Next slide, please. Um, just a review of what a contextual overlay does. Um, it provides standards for street setbacks, height limitations, building coverage limitations, and access standards um, that are all based on the existing development patterns of the surrounding properties, um, so the properties immediately adjacent to um, the properties within the overlay area. Um, as a reminder, these standards cannot be changed. Next slide, please. Um, the policy for these properties is within the suburban neighborhood maintenance policy. This policy is intended to do exactly as it says, which is to maintain the character of the established development pattern. This overlay would help to preserve the general character of the existing neighborhood with specific standards for bulk massing, access, garages, and parking. Um, the standards, will, standards required will continue to maintain the existing character within the neighborhood. Next slide, please. As the proposed overlay is consistent with the policy goals and meets the standards of the contextual overlay, staff recommends approval of the request. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks. Thank you and appreciate that. We'll open this item for public hearing. And on this particular item, uh, Council Member Benedict is, is the applicant. Um, Councilor Benedict, would you like to add anything? I know that you spoke earlier, but any, any other comments on this? Thank you, Chair. I do have comments, but I'd prefer to wait until after the public hearing, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That, that's perfectly fine. Thank you, Councilor Eddie. And so um, we, uh, we are now ready to take calls from, from the members of the public um, who wish to call in your screen should be 
uh, have your call-in number now, so please call in. You don't need to wait until um, after each of the speakers. You can call in and be placed in a queue. Once you're, we're uh, call in on this particular case, uh, and we can't visibly display a timer, so Sean will let you know um, when you have 30 seconds left and also when your two minutes is up. When you call in, please state your name and address for the record, and we appreciate everyone calling in. And so while we wait on um, folks to call in on this particular item, Lisa, did we get any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. We did not receive emails on this item. Okay. And so, Sean, any callers in the queue yet? Chair, we do have callers, so we'll get the first one lined up, and I'll let you know when we have them in. Thank you very much. Chair, you have the first caller. Excellent. Welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Hi, good evening. My name is Carla Campbell. Uh, I live within the proposed overlay 2013 Rosecliff Drive. Um, I am so proud to talk to you tonight in support of um, this contextual overlay. Um, really, this all began as um, the, the woman introducing said there was an adjacent overlay um, on an adjoining street. Um, and some of my neighbors and I um, learned about what an, an overlay is by viewing that. Um, and so my neighbors and I started knocking on doors um, up and down Rosecliff in an effort to extend that Dugger Heights um, overlay down Rosecliff. Um, we spent many months, um, several of us knocking on doors, talking to our neighbors. We knocked in June, July, and August. Um, we spoke um, to many people who supported it immediately. Some took a lot of time and they should to consider it. We didn't get to knock on everybody's door because um, COVID makes everything harder. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we got 20 signatures from homeowners representing 22 homes. That's more than half of the homeowners. Um, and we've provided those signatures to the councilwoman. Um, I like to consider that overwhelming support for the overlay on our street. And really, I, I want to just mention that it was a really powerful, um, a powerful effort to knock on doors, meet neighbors I'd never had a chance to meet on the far end. It was a wonderful community. Oh, yeah. Second. Thank you. And I want to say that this is an important overlay because the character of Rosecliff is so family friendly. Um, it's the kind of street where neighbors help each other. It's a dead end street. There are lots of pedestrians. There are lots of children riding bikes, including mine. And we want to continue to keep density down so that um, it can retain the character it has now, which is um, people who want to live here for a long, long time, who want to continue to be good neighbors to each other. We're not going to live for two or three years and then move away. People who look out for your time has expired. Please finish your thought. Thank you so much. And I just want to say I'm missing my kids' soccer practice, so I, it made me realize how much of, an, uh, of your time that you give. And so I thank all the commissioners for your public service and also my councilwoman who's worked really hard on this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Excellent. Welcome. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address. You may begin. My name. My name is Charles Bendall, and I live at 2001 Rosecliff Drive. I'm speaking in support of item 22, the contextual overlay on Rosecliff. I originally reached out to Councilwoman Benedict on August 6th in concern of apparent construction that was beginning next to me at the intersection of Rosecliff and Pr Preston. I discovered that HPR was created uh, and a building permit allowed for new construction of a duplex. This permit reads to construct the unit B with 2,673 square foot living area and a 700 square foot attached garage, max height of 45 feet, max of up to three floors, corner lot, rear unit. 
While the property itself is being built on the corner lot, to call this the rear unit is a bold misrepresentation as the unit is front facing on Rosecliff and with the driveway directly on Rosecliff. This will make three driveways all within the first 100 feet of Rosecliff uh, on the Preston intersection. It's already created a dangerous environment and will lead to wrecks in the future. The R10 zoning is not large enough for this lot to be split into its own separate lot. Yet we have allowed a HPR to have a permit with this building of this 2,600 square foot house that is more than double the size of every other single family home house uh, on our street. You know, it is a looming monstrosity and will be an eyesore for years to come. You know, Rosecliff and residents on Rosecliff still enjoy. Oh, you have 30 seconds. If we start splitting all lots for duplexes, it will become overcrowded and traffic that our street simply cannot control. Rosecliff is a charming street that I worry is in the risk uh, if we continue to allow these type of developments. While I may be too late to stop the construction occurring next to me, it is not too late to prohibit the continued activity on the rest of our street. I'd like to thank the council for their time and proper action to persevere our quiet street. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Welcome. Good. Hey there, how are you? Good. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Yes, hey there. I'm Jermaine Carruthers, and I reside at 2200 Rosecliff Drive. And, of course, that's in Nashville, Tennessee. One of the reasons why I'm calling that I'm opposed of them coming into the neighborhood and, and just building these tall and skinny homes that they have infiltrated throughout Nashville. So I want to be sure that this overlay is chosen. Because as I go throughout the different neighborhoods throughout Nashville, Tennessee, I see these condensed, packed, crowded, cluttered homes that have been infiltrated in these neighborhoods. And now they are starting to come to Rosecliff Drive. And something has to be done about that. We can't continue to allow these construction workers to come in and destroy our properties and our areas. I've had the opportunity to go around with petitions to our neighbors and their compassion about them not coming in and building all of these tall and skinny and large and bucket cluttered homes because it's causing all of this crowdedness as we go in South Nashville. It is crowded as we see on the side of hills that used to have uh, trees. It is crowded. And now they are trying to come and clutter Rosecliff Drive, and it has to stop. It has to end, and it must do it, and it must start now. And as I talk to some of the people in the neighborhood, oh, you thirty seconds. They are talking about the foundation issues. They are talking about the overpopulated area, the increased traffic. All of this is going to be detriment to our roads. The children that needs to run and play and ride their bikes on Rosecliff Drive have to be extra careful because we still have these issues of these tall, skinny, fat, cluttered homes. It must not happen on Rosecliff Drive. Find it in your hearts. Find it in your visceral. Follow your time has expired. Please finish your call. Overlay. Find it in your heart to vote for the consent to overlay. You all have a great night. Thank you, sir. And next caller, Tom. Chairman, you have the next caller. Excellent. Um, you have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address. You may begin. Hi, my name is Kelly Markham, and I live at 2111 Rosecliff. I'm calling to. I'm calling in tonight to state my support for the contextual overlay. In my opinion, this overlay is a continuous natural progression of the previous overlay that you recently approved. Our sweet streak is a quiet little corner of East Nashville that I want to protect. I would appreciate your vote and support to preserve our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you 
Terry, you have the next caller. Excellent. Welcome. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address. My name is Jonathan Lee. I'm the owner at 2100 Rosecliff Drive. I wanted to express my support for the overlay, but um, also express one concern I have, which is regarding the coverage um, limitations. I think may be somewhat prohibitive. Um, while I do want to limit, you know, development of the tall and skinnies and keep the character of the neighborhood, I feel like we might want a little more freedom in design to develop the existing houses uh, appropriately and develop them the way we want and might make them a little bigger. So if we could clarify uh, those coverage limitations or if I might suggest an amendment to that specific part, that would be great. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Excellent. Welcome. You have two, two minutes to speak, and please state your name and address. You may begin. Okay. Liz Edwards, and my address is 2011 Rosecliff Drive. Um, basically, my family and I lived on Rosecliff. We've lived in, on Rosecliff since 2013. Uh, my husband and I bought our house right after we got married and um, have since grown our family. Um, and our dream is to add on and hopefully make this our forever home um, and if this overlay goes through we would not be able to add on what we want to um, we live in a pretty small house so um, and you know I hate these tall and skinnies just as much as anyone um, they're awful so I really do understand this whole push um, but at the end of the day we just need more space and we do not want to move to the suburbs so I'm requesting a deferral so that hopefully we can figure out a way to keep these awful tall and skinny developers from coming in and ruining our charming, lovely, wonderful street, um, while also allowing families to grow and add on. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Welcome. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Greetings, Honorable Commissioners, Chair, Attorney Alex Dickerson. My name is Josh Somerville. I'm at um, 2024 Rosecliff Drive. And uh, I guess I'm just going to read a little ex excerpt from my email to Emily, Emily uh, earlier today. Um, I'm an architect and I'm against irresponsible out of scale infill that aims to maximize square footage to the detriment of an established neighborhood fabric. Um, but I do think that the way that the maximum coverage portion of the overlay is written is that it is um, potentially, it is restrictive to what I wanna do on my property in the future that I can currently do now. And in talking and speaking with several neighbors, they feel the same way. I think the previous caller, Liz, um, feels the same way. And um, additionally, in speaking with some of these folks today and yesterday on the subject, it's not 100% uh, apparent. There's a little bit of confusion in terms of um, specifically that, that item, the max coverage. Some people were doing calculations uh, in terms of their neighbor's complete um, total floor area and not their coverage or footprint and was giving erroneous numbers that I feel decisions were... Oh, you have 30 seconds. So that being said, I'd like to uh, request a deferral for one meeting so we can make sure that everyone on the street is educated correctly about what this means specifically for... Um, what what they're buying into and what they're agreeing or disagreeing to, I just feel like there's a little bit of lack of education that we could 
it would be wise to step back and um, allow that to happen. And uh, I appreciate y'all's time on it, and uh, we'll hang up and listen. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Okay. Gary, you have the next caller. Welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Diana Corcoran, and I am from 2102 Rosecliff Drive. Um, I, am, I am wanting the contextual overlay to go through for numerous reasons. I can add all of the reasons that the callers who are for this have already stated, but to add to that, I actually think it is good for the city in general, so it's not just our neighbourhood, but for the city. Um, I've invested in real estate all around the world, and I'm telling you that it's neighbourhoods that dictate the value of a city. And these developer-built developer homes will see neighbourhoods turn to slum. Um, they've got an eight-year life before they're needing significant funding for repairs. What this does is slowly reduce the socioeconomic situation of those areas and those who move into the houses in order to keep the, in order to you know keep them up to date and to make sure that they're not falling over. Um, you know, neighbourhoods that have already been experiencing these developers coming through, they're they're seeing diminishing returns on their investment. They're, it's already starting to re reduce valuations and also quality of life within Nashville. No one wants to live next door to these places, and I agree with everybody. I love to see the kids riding up and down this street. We don't need 50. You know, we don't need double the amount of occupants here. Nashville is enjoying such a boom, but if this city, you know, if we don't manage it, it will stay just that, just a single boom. It is economically smarter to protect the quality of the housing in order to maintain the growth and the desire for the city. Um, so I guess I'm thinking big picture here. Carla, you have 30 seconds. I've also lived in this street for seven years and um you know i want to live here for a lot longer and i just think it's the most beautiful street in east nashville and we'd be destroying it by not protecting it thank you next caller sean you have the next caller. Welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Erica Black, and I live at 1403 Quarter Drive. Um, earlier this year, my neighbors and I really came together and worked really, really hard to get a contextual overlay in place for Quarter and Duggar and um, the corresponding Rosecliff. And that actually just went into effect um, just a few weeks ago. And I just have to tell you, I was so excited when Emily Benedict um, reached out to me and connected me to a lot of neighbors on Rosecliff who wanted to see the overlay extended um, all the way up and down Rosecliff. Um, so I just have to say this has been the most amazing group effort really going out into the community. It was just it was incredible to see. Um, so many of my neighbors, my neighborhood, really just come together and want to protect our community from outside development. Um, and I don't say this lightly, but we as a neighborhood have been completely targeted by outside developers. Um, that is, it, I mean, it, it is constant. They are, I'm constantly getting phone calls and emails and knocks on doors. And I just really feel like this is an amazing opportunity for us to take back our neighborhood, um, it really does seem like on a weekly basis, houses here are getting bulldozed. So um, I, for one, am definitely in favor of extending the actual overlay to all of Rosecliff. Um, and I'm just really tired of seeing these outside, outside developers dictating the landscape of our, of our neighborhood. And I know it's restrictive, and I hate that, but I just don't know any other way to save the character and the Caller, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I just don't know. I, I know it's restrictive. I just don't know any other way to save kind of the integrity and character of the community. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Jerry, you have the next caller. 
Thank you. Welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Oh, okay. Can I go now? It's um, Ashley Miller, 2012 Rosebliff Drive. And um, basically, I just want to partially support the contextual overlay in the sense that I don't want outside developers coming in and putting up tall skinnies. However, I don't think there's enough information um, to allow us to know what we can add on to our property. Um, as Liz was saying earlier, um, you know, some people already have, you know, third story houses built into their property. So would we be allowed to do that? Will we be allowed to build a front porch if it's in, you know, with uh, the, you know, the look of the neighborhood? These are all things that aren't really discussed in the contextual overlay. So none of us really have a clear idea of what we can and what we can't do moving forward. So I think all of this needs to be addressed so we clearly know what we're voting on. But yes, I am definitely not um, uh, for people coming in and putting two houses on, you know, one existing lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Excellent. Welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Shauna Wells. I live at 2008 Rosecliff Drive. I'm calling um, in support of the contextual overlay. Um, here on Rosecliff, we are mostly small to medium-sized houses from the 1950s. These are now historic houses, and I'm so sad to see them disappearing all over East Nashville. They're built to last and could last another 100, 150 years if taken care of. A lot of the new buildings that are going up will not last and are not built to those standards. Also, we have lawns and mature trees, which give us so much character. And those often disappear when developers come in and build houses that uh, either are huge or the tall skinnies that take up every, um, every little bit of the yard. And also, um, we have kids that are playing on those lawns as part of our character. I noticed it on Sheridan, just one block over, many, many houses were knocked down, and there's about 12 large houses all crammed in together right next to each other. There's almost no front yard at all. There's just driveway, and there's that much more traffic. It's just, it completely changes the whole character of the neighborhood. So um, I just want to say that I'm in support of the contextual overlay. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Here you have the next caller. Hi, my name is Bonnie Davis. I live at 2024 Rosecliff Drive. Um, I'm calling to request a deferral because though I am certainly against tall skinnies and like for sure want to maintain the character of this street, uh, I think that I and then also many of our neighbors here just need more information and um, clarification about really how restrictive this would be for current homeowners who wish to, like many others, like grow a family, add on, because um, it seems like a lot of people were making decisions based on, um, like they thought that they could add on based on the, the square footage of their neighbors in their homes, but it turns out it's the footprint. So for a lot of these homes that are multi-level, that's a much lower number. So of course the average is lower. And then that means people can add on much less than maybe they initially thought. Um, so I think just as a little street and a block, we need some more education on this. And so for that reason, um, I'm requesting a deferral so I can get educated and then 
everyone, of course, can be educated and make the decisions that really are best for them based on, you know, accurate info. And that's all. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Excellent. Uh, welcome. Hi there. My name is John Fabke. I live at 2008 Rosecliff Drive. I'm speaking in support um, to uh, number 22 tonight. want to thank everybody for tuning in um, and appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to speak. I think, um, like a lot of people, I'm uh, in support of the, the overlay to uh, to preserve the, the quality of, of life on our little street. You know, like everybody that's spoken here, we've been here since 2013 and feel so fortunate um, to have uh, gotten a, a place in this neighborhood. It's such a wonderful neighborhood. The people are great as, you know, as everybody is it's mentioned just the, you know, the people's, you know, you kind of know folks in the neighborhood, the kids, you know, seem to be comfortable, especially during all the work at home and pandemic stuff, you know, people are, are you know, kids can play out in the street, you know, that we've don't have a lot of issues with, with traffic and, and, uh, and that, and that's, that's really huge. I think, uh, having seen so many of these neighborhoods, the neighborhood that we first lived in was just completely ruined by these this new housing. Um, you know, there's no, there's no the green space is taken away. The issues with with traffic, with the safety, certainly. I mean, there's been so many um, reports of folks during the oh, course. Yeah, of the if they've had a house built next to them, you know, people stealing water, power, and things like that. Um, not good. Also, um, uh, just the historic quality now. I mean, these houses are getting to the point of being 70 years old and having neighborhoods with these 70-plus-year-old um, uh, ranch houses is, has a historic value. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Good night. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Nice Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Hey, my name is Bill Pereer. I'm at 2113 Rosecliff Drive. And I am very much in favor of the spirit of the overlay. Um, but like several other callers have voiced, I have some, I would say, concern over a lack of education for me um, in, in knowing how that may or may not limit a property owners uh, really usage of their of their land on how they they can change it modify add on and that kind of thing but in general very much in support of limiting the um, the huge homes that are coming in uh, side by side and I, actually I live in one of the newer homes. But um, it, it, some of the designs are, are much less sympathetic, and the way that they're placed on the property is less sympathetic to the neighborhood. And and um, I, I will say that I have seen uh, families coming into those new homes, adding to the fabric of the of the neighborhood, which is a wonderful thing. So it's not like people moving into new homes are, are somehow bad. Uh, it's just that the uh, really the development needs to be more um, sympathetic. So uh, I am in favor, but perhaps with some more education attached for the property owners around here so that they know what they're signing up for. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, we don't currently have other callers. We'll take a brief pause and then I'll check back in. Thank you.
Chair, we have no additional callers in the queue for this item. Thank you. And so now we are at the part where uh, Council Member Benedict, would you like to speak? Thank you, Chair. I think it's probably a good thing for me to speak on a few fronts. Um, so it certainly sounds from these calls a little bit of an education, I think, for all of us. I think by my count, I've counted about um, nine or 10 folks in support and five folks that were looking for more information. And I think, you know, with all that we've dealt with with COVID that we sometimes feel restricted in getting information out. So this information has been pushed out to the public, not only through the normal, um, uh, not only through the normal, uh, sorry, all the messages coming to turn all the devices off here. Uh, not only through the normal process of sending out notices, but also through social media and my uh, email database. Obviously, that does not touch all 20,000 people in the district. Um, so based on the feedback, it sounds like getting more information out to folks might be the right thing to do. Um, initially, what I will tell you is that this was um, overwhelmingly supported. A couple of the folks at the start of the call talked about uh, the communication with the neighbors and everything was positive. Um, as one of them said, they sent me um, uh, overwhelming information about support from the street. So for me, when I look back at what I campaigned about 14, 15 months ago, I talked about sustainability in our neighborhoods. And if you look, looking at the map that's on the screen right now, you see that almost, well, every single house that's in the uh, red outline, the proposed overlay is one of those older homes. Uh, maybe one on the north side of Rosecliff, but um, to the south and to the north of the, the, the outline, you see where the HPRs begin and they go on and on and on. And HPRs are not the issue here. And I hope that the community understands that this is not a zone change. Folks, and this is, I've been clear about this. People will still be able to build uh, either a single family or a duplex or uh, horizontal property regime, two homes on a lot. It's just that it's going to change how those homes look and that it's going to uh, blend in with the neighborhood better than the towering tall skinnies next to them, which is rampant throughout the South Inglewood area. Um, the, 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 the support that I had about making sure that, our, that Inglewood stays Inglewood, especially deep into the neighborhood. So we spoke about Ivy Drive a few months ago. This is one of those areas where it's deep into the neighborhood. It's stepped from Shelby Bottoms. And in fact, at the end of Rosecliff, you can access Shelby Bottoms basically uh, just down the street. So, you know, we're really deep in the neighborhood here. Density matters, but let's make sure that it looks good. Um, and that's what the, the community asked for. So I've only received actually um, uh, concerns about this since Monday of this week. So in all the months that we've been working on this, there's not been any concern. Of course, the mailers went out sometime a few weeks ago, and um, yet it was just before this. And I know we all go through this with any, any uh, planning hearings as well, but there had not been any um, opposition to it up to this point. For me, I want to make sure that our neighborhood, that um, it looks like what people have told me they want it to look like. Uh, I understand the concerns about um, the uh, lot coverage, and so I think we need to provide some clarity there. Uh, one challenge that we have as you look at the southern um, block face of Rosecliff is that it is the entire block face. There's no opportunity based on the contextual overlay guidelines, there's or, uh, there's no opportunity to split this up and say the folks to the south of Quarter Drive or the south of Duggar Drive are not included. It has to include that entire block face. So that I think is a, has become um, of concern in particular to um, Mr. Somerville, who, uh, re who and I, uh, who reached out to me earlier this week and we spoke today about this. But um, I've asked staff to outline those guidelines today. And um, I know that uh, Amelia spoke to those earlier. And I'm looking at my notes here just to make sure I covered everything here. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest concern is building that three-story tall skinny right next to these little brick ranches from 1950. It's not a NIMBY issue. It's a what's the vision for Nashville issue. Is how do we want Nashville to look? How do we want Inglewood to look? And we use the word equity a lot these days, but we don't always use it with real action. 
So I ask you guys to make a decision, sorry, commissioners, I ask you to make a decision um, that will create equitable zoning, an equitable uh, zoning overlay that'll create, um, you know, that, that'll put into action to both existing and future residents, you know, an equitable um, opportunity to live, a place to live where it, it you know, where you can walk amongst your neighbors and you're not just in your tall skinnies um, next to everybody uh, looking in each other's windows. So these folks, that's what they're looking for. They want to enjoy what Inglewood is now and what it what it can be, um, but it does take your support to do this. Um, and I, um, as always, appreciate your diligent care and uh, review of the application. I certainly am wide open to having a community meeting about this. I did not know that there was opposition, as I said um, earlier, until Monday of this week. So I thought that there was overwhelming support. Knowing that there's opposition, I wanna make sure that those folks are heard. Um, however, based on the timeline here, I would ask the commission to approve this and um, I'll have that uh, public meeting in advance of bringing this to council um, and advancing it at council. I do think this is what the community is looking for. I think that will give them the opportunity to understand those guidelines more and um, and and then give me a decision. I certainly, I think as a council, uh, council lady Murphy um, understands, I'm not interested in bringing legislation to the council that is not supported by the community. And of course, we'll have another public hearing there. So with that, um, I have taken up too much time and I appreciate your work on this. Look forward to your discussion. And uh, again, I ask for your approval tonight uh, with the expectation that I will hold a community meeting afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, appreciate that. And so seeing uh, no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed and we are now into discussion. Commissioner Sims, do you want to go first? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, uh, Councilman Benedict, I've been so impressed with the way you engage your neighborhood and try to help them to solve this. Um, my own personal neighborhood just went through this and it was so divisive. It was really kind of sad. And I think in this kind of situation, because you are actually helping to lead this, because the only thing that's really been said against this is actually a request for more information that um, I would certainly like to do what you've asked for us to approve it. And then you go ahead and start continuing to educate and help your own neighborhood know that um, this is really for their good over the long haul. I live in a neighborhood that didn't get a contextual overlay and there's just so few tools to protect our neighborhoods. So my hat's off to you for trying this and I agree to approve this. Um, on my boat. So. Thank you. Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, overlays are not easy to do. Um, no matter how much you um, try to communicate and knock on doors and do mailings, um, there's always going to be questions and there's always going to be people who um, for one reason or another did not get the information until late in the process. Um, and there's always some misinformation or, or misunderstandings about it. Um, I've, I've experienced that in my own district. I've experienced it with rezones that I've, I've personally knocked the doors on. Um, so I completely understand where, um, how sometimes with overlays late in the game, a lot of questions will come out. Um, I think that it's great that this was neighbor led and then brought to the councilwoman. That's how I prefer overlays and zone changes to to occur in my own district is that they need to kind of start organically like that and then and then picked up and carried by the council person so i think she's done a lot with that and i think the neighbors have done a lot of work there in the time of covid that of course adds just an extra layer of difficulty when you're when you're dealing with with, with these type of of overlays and zone changes. And so I think that they've done everything they could. I do recommend to the councilwoman that she have a community meeting so that there is more understanding. Um, the math on these are sometimes difficult. Um, and so making sure that that is communicated clearly is important. And so I, I am glad that she is willing and open to do that. Um, and, and I am willing to commit to this body as well that I will hold her to holding a community meeting if we decide this to pass this tonight, which I'm comfortable with. Um, but I will definitely, if, if she doesn't hold it, I will 
be more than happy to send it back to us. Um, but want to hear everybody else's opinion as well. Thank you, Council Lady. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to uh, thank you for the neighbors, and it is wonderful to uh, witness uh, their investment to the neighborhood and commitment to the neighborhood, and you know their effort and using available tool to uh, protect, preserve neighborhood on their liking. So it is uh, excellent to see uh, those organic work in. Uh, developed and also uh, thank for the uh, council lady Benedict for her leadership and commitment to a uh, continue uh, com community meeting uh, however difficult under the circumstances but I really do appreciate the uh, commitment and you know like uh, previous commissioner says, Commissioner Sims and Council Lady Murphy stated, it is so hard to uh, install or overlay. Not 100%, you know, can agree on certain things. And, but it is clear, you know, even though some people who asked for deferral, uh, what they want is more clear explanation. So having uh, Council, Lady Benedict's a commitment to continue community engagement and continue education. Uh, I am um, uh, supportive of uh, approving tonight and then ask a neighborhood and council lady to uh, continue engagement and more clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. Uh, I can't add anything to my fellow commissioners. I think this has been well thought out. Uh, the council lady's done a lot of work. Uh, as long as she'll commit to this community meeting, I'm going to support it. Thank you, Commissioner Gobble. I agree. <clears throat> I agree with Commissioner Haynes. I think they've covered it well. Commissioner Tibbs, your last. Yeah, I'm similar you know i think that's been very well thought out and um and if i understand correctly the the questions that um are still remaining there's still time for the uh council person um who's done a great job and the and they really hats off to the the uh, neighborhood and community but I, I do there are some questions and they're valid questions but uh, i think that um you know she uh w w can definitely be able to convey those answers uh and in whatever the best way to do it but i think there's still time to do it and i definitely would encourage her to do that which i'm sure she's she might be doing as we speak um I, she seems to be very transparent in what she's working on so with that i'd like to make a motion to approve that's a proper motion and is there a second so so the commissioner raise your hand your icon hand Oh, no, no, that's good. Uh, Commissioner Gobble. Um, <laughs> second. All right, proper second. There's been a proper motion, proper second. Any other discussion? If you'll raise your hand. Commissioner Tibbs, you don't have a question, do you? Your hand is raised. You made the original. Okay, perfect. Any other discussion? You'll raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it. And adopted. We are now on to item number 23. Okay, this is Jordan Donovan with planning, and I'll be presenting item 23. Next slide, please. This is a request uh, for rezoning from RS20 to RM2. Next slide. The staff recommends approval. Next slide. 
This property is located in Madison. It's just south of Chadwell Drive, and the surrounding zoning is single-family residential and multifamily residential. Next slide. The policy is suburban neighborhood maintenance. This policy places an emphasis on retaining the existing suburban character of neighborhoods while considering some important factors, such as the transition of density. Next slide. This proposed zone change provides that transition of density between the large multifamily zone lots to the west and the more established single family lots to the east along Craig's Off. Therefore, staff recommends approval. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, is the applicant on the line? Oh, hold on. Hold on a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's open this item up for public hearing. Sean, is the applicant on the line? Chair, we do have representatives of the applicant, and they're unmuted for you to recognize. Excellent. You have 10 minutes to speak. You may save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. And please state your name and address, and you may begin. Uh, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, please proceed. Uh, this is Trip Smith, uh, 2606 Eugenia Avenue, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'd like to thank the commissioners for their time. I will try to be brief uh, and respect it. Would also like to thank uh, Joran and planning staff and uh, Council Lady Van Rees for their effort uh, in working through this zone change request. Um, I know it was probably more than they maybe intended originally. Um, as as the council lady mentioned um, at the beginning of the meeting, we were originally scheduled to be held at the August 27th planning meeting and uh, scheduled and hosted a neighborhood meeting in early August. Um, after presenting a conceptual site plan and some conceptual elevations, architectural elevations and floor plans, um, and hearing some of the neighborhood's concerns, we, uh, at the council lady's request, decided to defer um, and then later uh, on in the month, deferred indefinitely to continue to try to work uh, with the neighborhood uh, on a compromise and, and adjust our, our conceptual layout so their, to meet their concerns. Um, so uh, during that period of time, the, the plan we originally presented uh, at, the, at the initial neighborhood meeting was uh, the option to uh, keep the existing home and construct three new homes on the property, which is afforded under the RM2 zone change request. Uh, following working with the uh, adjacent neighbor at Chadwell and, and other adjacent neighbors along Graycroft, um, the owner uh, committed to reducing that uh, by one home to two new homes on the property, um, which would essentially be the equivalent density of the base zoning at RS20 right now, if you were to subdivide to three lots. Um, as, uh, as, as planning staff has mentioned, the zone change request is con consistent with the policy uh, in the area and we feel provides an appropriate transition uh, from the office and higher density multifamily uh, to the south at due west um, to transition to the single family uh, uses to the north. Um, we would just ask that the planning commission consider our coordination effort, uh, both with the council person with staff and with the neighborhood um, when reviewing and, and deciding upon the zone change request. And that's um, all I have and would like to reserve uh, the two minutes to, to rebut any opposition. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will reserve you two minutes for rebuttal. And now we are ready to take calls from the public who wish to call in. So your screen should show a call in number call in right away. You don't have to wait till each speaker speaks because you'll be placed into a queue. You'll have two minutes to speak. And uh, we don't have a timer uh, uh, that you can see. So we will, uh, Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds left and then we'll also let you know when your time is up. So please call in now. We appreciate everybody calling in. And so while we wait on folks to call in, um, Lisa, do we have any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman, this is Lisa. We did receive seven emails in support and nine emails in opposition. Okay, thank you very much. 
And Sean, do we have any callers on the line? Chair, we do have callers, so we'll get the first one um, put in in just a moment. Thank you. Chair, you have the first caller. Okay, thank you. And uh, you'll welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Okay, thank you for taking my call. My name is Ann Richardson, and I live at 298 Port Drive. I'm speaking in opposition to 1013 Shadwell. I live close by, and I'm one of the leaders of the Kemper Heights Neighborhood Association in which this property falls. I and our neighborhood association, as well as the adjoining neighborhood association, the South Madison, are against this development and this zoning change. We were surprised when our council member came back for more development in this area, and we don't understand why she has so aggressively pushed this particular one or the way the details have been handled, especially given all the related history and remaining unresolved issues with Chadwell Commons, including the property next to it at 1011 and 0 Chadwell. The proposed development will be taking the buffer away from whatever will now be built at those addresses. We're also very concerned about keeping the integrity of our neighborhood, which contains many mid-century modern and similar homes and nice large lots. That's why many of us invested and purchased here in Kemper Heights. To see developers come in and buy these older homes and lots and start to rezone, proposing to do things like cramming four homes total into a yard that used to only hold one, threatens the integrity of the neighborhood, our neighborhood and could create a dangerous precedent or domino effect. We fear the promises made by the former owner, Plunkett, who sold Chadwell Cottages after making promises will not be kept. Um, we fear these parcels will all be combined if the zoning goes through and even more development crammed in this area. I submitted a traffic in, in January that I had been working on for some time for port and other streets because traffic is already an issue and there are already too many dangerous areas related to traffic along with two schools in numerous school zones. Um, too many things have gone wrong through this process too, and too many neighbors' concerns and issues have not been fully addressed. Every time we turn around, we feel like we're hearing about another small portion of the big picture over here around the old hospital. It's coming to us in a piecemeal fashion and makes it difficult to see the big picture. We also seem to be missing emails that I know we're All sending. All time has expired. Please finish your thought. Um, I know we're missing some emails, and I would like to talk to someone later about that because I know there were more than nine than in opposition. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, you have the next caller. Welcome. We have two minutes to speak. Okay. Hello. My name is Tony Richardson, and I live at 298 Port Drive in Madison. I'm a founding member of the Kemper Heights Neighborhood Association, and I'm speaking today in opposition to the zoning request for 1013 Chadwell. Uh, aside from the obvious public works issues such as traffic, water, and sewer, and general congestion that is already a problem in our neighborhood, this rezoning will open the door to a fundamental change in the character and integrity of our neighborhood. It will displace the wildlife, which call this area home, and remove what little buffer we have left from the impending urbanization of the Due West Corridor. We feel we've been often misled and left out of portions of the conversation on this particular development by our council person. We voiced our opinions as a neighborhood on this development in an online forum with the developer and our council member and all who were present were opposed, though we were not allowed to actually speak during the meeting. We were then told by our council member that the item was indefinitely deferred and that she would come back to the community if things changed. She did not come back for our input, and instead we found that the motion was back before planning via her district newsletter. We then asked them both to uh, for a deferral so the neighborhood could regroup and get caught up, and they both refused. The zoning change will open the door for a domino effect for development and will fundamentally change our neighborhood, which has large lots and an elementary school and churches, and change it into a more congested urban environment. Uh, we understand that development will happen, but our area has had to absorb and single family developments, which has resulted in near 1,000 new doors in the last two years alone. We feel that this part of our district has absorbed enough housing at this time. 
We ask that this motion be denied and that the integrity and character of our neighborhood be preserved as the green, spacious, family-friendly neighborhood we all move here to live in. Thanks. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Excellent. Welcome. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address. You may begin. Thank you very much. My name is Kenneth White, and I am with the South Madison Neighborhood Association. I live at 206 Beverly Drive here in the neighborhood, and I'm calling representing our neighbors on Graycroft Avenue, whose properties abut the um, property that is looking to rezone. Um, our biggest issue, we, we are in opposition of the rezoning, and our biggest issue is that um, this is being presented as a buffer to the uh, property to the west, which was also recently rezoned to RM2. Um, it was our understanding that that property to the west was the buffer, and so now we're being presented with the idea that this new property is the buffer to the property of the west, <laughs> and uh, so we... Um, want to make sure that it maintains the current zoning and keeps the character of the other houses around it, which are also zoned RS-20. Um, that's all I wanted to say. I think everyone else has kind of covered our other issues. I just want to thank everyone for their time. Thank you, commissioners, and thank you, Council Member Van Rees. Everyone have a good night. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Well, oh, sorry. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address. You may begin. My name, my name is Beth Waller, and I live at 1012 South Graycroft Avenue. Uh, my property backs up to where they're wanting to put the, the new homes. And we oppose this tremendously. Our family, like others in the neighborhood, bought this area for the large lots and the the peacefulness when we would get home and enjoy the uh, you know the the area the large lot the serenity the wildlife and by putting two more homes back there is is it's ridiculous and you cannot see from the picture that you're looking at. But all of that green space that you see on that picture, it's not going to stay there because they're already cramming in townhomes and apartments. And if you put houses right behind our lot, then that's going to take away that buffer that we had when we agreed to the zoning change for the new developments with the townhomes and apartments and 12 houses and what's going to be called or what we loosely called Chadwell Commons. But, you know, the one other thing, if you start letting people buy these homes with large lots, change their zoning and start putting houses, more houses on these large lots, then that's what everybody's going to do. They're going to start buying. Developers. developers will continue to buy properties that are for sale on these large lots ask for rezoning so that they can put more houses on here. Please do not allow this to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next caller. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Hi, my name is Alexis Dansby, and I live at 212 Holiday Drive. I called to express my opposition to the proposed development at 1013 Chadwell Drive. I'm opposed to this development due to the orientation and vagueness of this proposed development. During the virtual community meeting, all participants agreed we felt we had more questions than answers. We expected some type of detailed follow-up, but never received that. We did, however, receive an email stating that the development was once again scheduled to be heard before the Planning Commission. 
I am disappointed in the stonewalling tactics that have been used throughout this process. I've seen letters of support being sent from individuals who live outside of this neighborhood, although we were told only contiguous neighbors' input were being considered. I truly feel the approval of this zoning request will start a trend of building homes behind established houses to get around horizontal space constraints, taking away the green space and character of Madison. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, we have no additional callers at the moment, so we'll take a brief pause and I'll check back in. Thank you. Chair, we have no additional callers in the queue for this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do want to thank all the callers for calling in, and now we are on to the rebuttal. Is the applicant on the line still? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. You have two minutes. Uh, yes, I, I, I would just like to respond and reiterate again that, that the zone change request is, is consistent with the policy in the area. Um, and is supported by planning as, as recommended in the staff report. It is contiguous with the adjacent RM2 zoning. Um, regarding the assertion that we're cramming uh, houses onto one lot, the, the density that we are proposing with the two new homes behind the existing home, um, it uh, works out to, to a single family home on a, a lot essentially that's in excess of a half acre uh, with the existing lot being 1.8 acres. Um, additionally, we, we heard the neighborhood concerns during the neighborhood meeting. Uh, the owner worked with the adjacent property owner on Chadwell uh, to meet his concerns. Uh, we thought that we had addressed the um, neighbor's concerns at Graycroft, and the owner offered to uh, move the conceptual site layout of the proposed homes uh, an additional to 30 feet off the side property line, which is in excess of the required side setback. Uh, and is also three times the side setback uh, that would be required if you were to, to develop under the single family base zoning as is. Um, so again, we just like to point uh, the commissioners to consider uh, our effort to, to coordinate as best we can with these neighbors, the compromises that we did make uh, in reducing the density uh, based on what would what would be afforded by the zone change um, and ask that we can you consider our effort with with the neighborhood and the council uh, lady to to work through these issues. Thank you. And now we are ready for the council lady. Council Lady Van Rees. Uh, yes, uh, I've, I've made it to the hotel room, so hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knew that I was able to listen in to the entire meeting while traveling. And so uh, I want to make sure people knew that I heard them. Uh, I know that there were a lot of uh, emails that came in on both sides in regard to this. And there's an overwhelming frustration by several of us on the Metro Council trying to have normal uh, community meetings. And so we took extra time to try to make sure that comments uh, could come in uh, during that time period. Uh, I uh, am frustrated that I can't um, uh, find a, uh, a compromise that seems to um, address everyone's concern, uh, but I will uh, note that the additional uh, buffer to the homes, uh, to the backyards um, of the folks on uh, South Graycroft has been achieved. And um, <clears throat> when looking at that map, a large portion of the area um, that is next to the highway is actually Metro Parks land. And the idea for the uh, aforementioned um, temporary name of Chadwell commons to actually uh, uh, protect um, both the park, um, their, uh, uh, I think it was quarter or half acre lots, and then uh, to transition similarly uh, with this parcel uh, made sense as we transitioned uh, from due west uh, down 
um, I heard a, a couple different folks indicate that they thought that this lot was green space. Um, it's the park that is the green space and the and the parcel, uh, the um, uh, overlay, if you will, behind uh, these homes that would remain green space in these designs. Uh, now this is a base zone, it's not an SP, so you don't have you know specific plans. There's a layout that's been promised um, and there uh, have been promises made in regard to buffers. And uh, as I've mentioned to uh, several uh, constituents that at the council level, I'll be adding an amendment uh, with a letter from the property owner indicating that intention um, so that uh, it's it's in writing, um, and that those those things are my compromise. Um, compromise means that not everybody's happy, um, but I, I believe that it, it's it's a reasonable compromise, and I look forward uh, to being able to uh, hopefully in 2021 meet with these two uh, very young neighborhood associations um, who uh, have formed and yet been uh, kind of hobbled by the coronavirus to actually have in-person meetings um, of their own uh, for me to go and speak to, to more people. So um, with that, uh, I just uh, simply ask uh, this uh, planning commission to uh, take into account the staff's recommendations and uh, I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Councilor. And seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so now we're on to discussion. How about we start with Commissioner Haynes? Um, I, I think this relies on Council Lady Van Reese's commitment to continue to make the changes as it goes through Council. Um, I happen to know this area very well. I went to Chadwell Elementary School. Um, I think the zone change is appropriate, uh, but I do think the neighbor's concerns need to be heard as the council letter continues to proceed through council. So I'll support staff's recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Gobble. Um, I'm inclined to support it as well. What are the dimensions of this lot? Do we know what they are? staff who wants to answer that from the staff it's the lot is uh, 1.7 acres yeah but how wide is it and how deep is it I'm measuring it right now okay just close About 100 feet wide by 730 feet deep. Okay, so I, yeah, I am a little concerned about how you stack three houses there. Um, you know, I, I agree with Commissioner Haynes. I su certainly support the council lady, and I support the. Um, and I understand staff's con concept. I'm kind of inclined to support it as well, but I am. It would be nice to, <clears throat> when they're getting to the, all the details in writing, to kind of get an idea of how that's going to fit on that site and how you make it work. Um, but I'll listen to the rest of the rest of the commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Tibbs. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm a little. Uh, a little torn on, I, I guess mostly just because of the what I've heard mostly that it seems like the neighborhood needs more understanding what's going to happen. I should say principally, I don't see a, a lot of, uh, you know, just kind of right straight forward. I think I hear, uh, you know, a lot of the... Uh, it's, it's not as dramatic as I think some of the comments I've heard, but I still always get a little concerned when there's so much somewhat misunderstanding, I think, of what's going to happen. Um, I would generally be a, uh, in approval to um, uh, what uh, uh, 
the staff has already uh, recommended. Um, I think two homes is probably not as obtrusive as many people believe. Uh, and I, I do believe Council Lady Van Rees is um, probably trying to figure out the best way to, to navigate through this. But maybe there's a little bit more work to do just to make sure that they're all on the same page. Um, or le like, you you may not ever get a unanimous approval on it, but uh, just make sure that you know every effort has been made to make sure people understand. Um, I, I probably want to hear more the the last few what they say before I decide which way I definitely would vote. Thank you, Commissioner Sims. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm perplexed with this one too, just because of the comments that the neighborhood is saying. Uh, and we're all very familiar with how hard um, Councilwoman Van Reese works to make sure everybody's on the same page. I wish this had come to us as an SP because I really don't like zone changes where we're relying on something that's outside our purview. And although I believe Nancy, uh, commission, the Councilwoman will actually do what she says, it's just, I would be afraid if I were living in this neighborhood to just go for a zone change without any kind of, of SP that would hold them to what they're saying. Um, so just like a Councilman Tibbs, I want to wait and see what everybody else is saying. Thank you. Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Um, I Looking at this, um, I hear the concerns of the neighbors and having a neighborhood maintenance policy, I mean, the policy does, as I, I feel like I quote this all the time, um, you know, you expect some change, but, but relatively the overall pattern um, is supposed to stay somewhat stable. And of course there are boundaries and there's areas and there are exceptions to that, but, but seeing something go from an RS20 to an RM2 feels like a very big change. Um, echoing what Commissioner Sims said about, you know, while we trust the council lady, it's going to do what she said about, you know, making sure that a letter is attached and things like that. As in hearing the neighbors and, and I would too also be concerned, a straight zone change is a straight zone change. And whether we, um, you know, we really can't put a lot of conditions on that. Uh, because it's a straight zone change. If this was an SP, I'd feel a lot more comfortable um, in hearing that there has been confusion about it moving forward um, and how difficult it is to communicate in the time of COVID. I'm just wondering if this one needs to sometimes, you know, slowing something down to get there faster is a better approach to zoning than, you know, hoping that it works out by the time we get to third and final reading at the council. And so, I don't think this one has been filed at council yet. And so it might be a good idea to, to slow this one down, have a, have some more, just have a community meeting or some more um, just education before it moves forward, or at least, you know, get the, whatever attachments that council lady Van Reese wants to attach, you know, show that to us ahead of time. So we can help be that, that carrot and stick for her to make sure that it's a better bill and a better outcome for the neighbors uh, and the whole development in the long run. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too have a lot of uh, concern of uh, this uh, zone change. I do agree, you know, some kind of transition will be good because the property right next to it is uh, RM2. And then going to establish the neighborhood with, uh, I believe it is RS20. So there's some uh, transition buffer, smooth transition is needed. but. As of right now, I'm not convinced this RM2 zoning is a good one because one, uh, this is a neighborhood maintenance a policy. Two, uh, this is a very unique lot, uh, 100 feet uh, frontage, although this is deep. So if they were to, you know, uh, subdivide, 
uh, that lot, I don't think it's going to meet with uh, subdivision regulation. And then uh, if uh, whomever uh, proposed to have, I think, Council Ladies uh, Van Lee's letter, it will be uh, to farmhouse. So I'm not convinced this, you know, straight zone change is we can hold the developer account for that because they may have uh, that intent and uh, I'm sure Council Lady Van Lees will uh, hold that uh, developer to that, you know, commitment. However, uh, it is just a straight zone change. So I feel much, much comfortable if it's SB and guaranteed uh, so many buffers and open space and so forth. But what we are consider is just straightforward zone change. And I, I think uh, I may ask either staff or our legal counsel, if uh, this zone change going through, and if some kind of attachment from a council lady uh, going through the zone change, how uh, legal legally accountable with this attached uh, letter or condition to straight a uh, straightforward zone change? Is our attorney still on the line? Yeah, I'd have to um, let me let me try to look at that. I, I don't have the answer right in front of me, but I'll I'll take a look and I'll let you know if I can find something. Okay. Anything else, Council uh, Commissioner Jones? Yes. Uh, so yeah. Well, uh, you know, if this whatever the attachment and what kind of a development, a specific buffer, you know, as if in uh, SP zoning, and those conditions hold tight you know, commitment, I'm okay with it, it. But otherwise, I have so much, uh, you know, concern, and I rather, you know, uh, ask Council Lady to defy it and come back with uh, SP. So, but I'm interested here, uh, our legal counsel's uh, answer. Thank you. Hi, Chairman, this is Lisa with Metro Planning. Um, I was gonna speak to um, the question in regards to can you hold someone to something that's sort of a design-based standard attached to a straight zone change? Yes. Um, and I think that when we're looking at straight zone changes, there are times when we will include conditions that have to do with the health and safety, such as dedicating right-of-ways, um, but it is much more difficult to enforce any, any sort of design-based standard on a straight zone change. That's very helpful. Alex, do you have anything to add to that? No, I'd agree with Ms. Milligan on that point. Okay. Uh, so every everyone has spoke. Uh, all the commissioners have spoken. Any? We are now. We now need a motion. We will need a motion. If. Um, is there a commissioner that would like to raise their icon hand and make a try to make a motion? Of some sort. Uh, so we uh, let me say this real quick. So we we had so the the council lady has her hand raised, but we're council lady we're under discussion. Um, let me ask the council lady what 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 she wants to to state before we. I call another commissioners and we'll council lady. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a recommendation for a motion. Is that possible? Well, well, yeah, we, we so I, I'm always, uh, you know, when we get into sticky situations, it's always helpful to, uh, it, it, to get input from the council member. And so I always try to give lots of leeway. So what would be the suggestion? Well, after hearing some of the concerns about um, the enforceability of what uh, the property owner has uh, committed, um, I'd like to ask um, someone to on the commission to make a motion uh, for the applicant to come back to this commission 
with um, uh, SP uh, zoning with the promises that have been made already to the community in more of a, a solidified form. Uh, if, if I think that that um, would address some of these concerns. Thank you for the opportunity to, to say that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. So, uh, Commissioners, we're still on discussion. Commissioner Sims, your hand was raised next. Oh, I thought you were going to ask for a motion. So, um. well, uh, so we got clarification from the the council lady. You know, I always try to right before. You know, we always try to be very respectful here, here at the commission. Try to make sure everybody gets their questions in. And so, why don't we hold off on a motion real quick? Because there's a couple <laughs> hands raised, uh, icon hands, and then and then we'll, I'll come back to you to make the motion a motion if if that's okay with you. Is that okay, Commissioner Sims? Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Johnson. Any more Thank discussion? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I, I, I do appreciate uh, Council Lady Van Rees's uh, comment. I uh, wholeheartedly agree uh, other than instead of uh, going up and down with a, a straight zone, I think uh, to abundantly clear uh, SP zoning will be warranted. So I really okay. appreciate that suggestion. Okay, let's go. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Commissioner Sims, you want to? I think after hearing the council lady, you want to make a motion to. Uh, let's ask. Um, let's ask the staff though what the proper procedure. That's let's good. ask Lisa. I, I, I believe it'd be an indefinite deferral and then they could reapply with SP, but I, I want to make sure Lisa or the director count. Lisa, no, we can't hear you, Lisa. I see you're hi, unmuted. Chairman, just, just, hi, Chairman, just a second. Um, yes, okay. So, I, I mean, I think that we have a couple of different options for process. If you want to, I think that they have a plan that they have been working with, so it may not be necessarily necessary to defer it indefinitely. Um, we would just need to defer it long enough to be able to um, see the plan and review it um, and then get it and then bring it back to you all. Um, okay. If, if, so maybe if, two meetings? If it does, yes, two meetings should work. And I would also say that if the intensity of the SP, for instance, what this rezoning um, permits, a, a rezoning to RM2 would permit a certain number of units. In this, in this case, I believe it would permit three. Um, if they're only proposing two units, then I think that we wouldn't necessarily have to re-notice either because we would be changing it to something that's less intense than what we've already noticed. So if you all defer to a date certain, then we can review the plan, come up with appropriate conditions, and then bring it back. So I think two meetings would be enough. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Sims, you've heard from the council lady and the staff, we're ready for a motion. I'm sorry, I got impatient. I was, that's what I thought we were going to do is probably do two meetings. So uh, okay. I did make a motion that we defer this uh, zoning change, this case for two, for two meetings. Excellent. And uh, that's a proper motion. Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Johnson. I second the motion. That's a proper second. Any discussion? If you'd raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. The motion is to defer for two meetings, and we are now seeing no other discussion. We're ready for roll call. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. <clears throat> aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it. It's deferred two meetings with the intent come back with a new plan. All right, so now we we finish item 23. We are on we have two items left. Uh, and I think 
you know, we've gone on long enough. Does everybody want to power through? I hope we'll try. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Item 25. We're on. All right. We're almost finished. And that's Patrick. Patrick, where's he at? Good evening, uh, Commissioner Atkins. This is Patrick Napier at the call center. Uh, I'll be presenting item 25 on behalf of the uh, um, land development. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, as soon as we get the slides queued up, we'll begin. Okay, the next item on this evening's agenda is item 25, a rezone case 2020Z113PR-001. Next slide, please. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A zoning. Next slide, please. Staff's recommendation is to approve. Next slide, please. The property is located at 717 27th Avenue North, approximately 250 feet south of Booker Street and contains a total of 0.21 acres. Next slide, please. The site is currently zoned RS5, which requires a minimum 5,000 square foot lot and is intended for single family dwellings. Next slide. Policy for the site is T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving. This policy is intended to create and enhance urban residential neighborhoods that provide more housing choice, improve connectivity, and moderate to high density development patterns with shallow setbacks and minimal space in between buildings. Next slide. The image you see on the screen is a current land use map. Um, the yellow indicates single family. The green indicates an institutional use such as a church. The light pale blue or maybe light pale green, depending on your color, uh, a vacant lot, and the orange is a two-family use. Um, the red you see is commercial. Um, as you can see, the neighborhood consists predominantly of one and two-family residential uses, um, and the requested zoning R6A will include enhanced standards for the location of access, driveways, and parking, which is designed to enhance the pedestrian environment. The R6A zone district would require access from the existing alley, thereby reducing curb cuts and potential conflicts with pedestrians. The site is located approximately 315 feet from Clifton Avenue, which is located to the south of the site. This is identified as a collector street by the major and collector street plan. Bus service runs along 28th Avenue North, and an MTA bus stop is located to the west, approximately 1,400 feet away from the site. This neighborhood contains an extensive sidewalk network, which allows safe pedestrian travel. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the requested zone change would add diversity in housing stock for the immediate neighborhood, while the alternative zoning district standards of the R6A zone district will require enhanced design um, along with access and building placement. Therefore, the request is consistent with the goals of the T4 Neighborhood Evolving Policy and staff recommends approval. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing. Sean, is the applicant on the line? Chair, we do have uh, the applicant and they are unmuted and available to be recognized. Thank you. Welcome, applicant. You have 10 minutes to speak, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Please state your name and address, and welcome. You may begin. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Is everyone able to hear me? Yes, we hear you. Wonderful. Thank you. Matthew Bolton with Team 06. Uh, we are the uh, would be the the buyer of this property. Uh, we're the ones that have brought it uh, before the commissioners. Commissioners Patrick, uh, rest of the planning staff. We appreciate you guys giving so much time this evening. You are almost there. Thank you again. Uh, as Patrick laid out, this property uh, does meet the current community character of T4NE. 
Um, it, it's, as you saw on the current land use map around the area, it's a very mixed use area with a lot of high, higher density, uh, commercial and industrial surrounding um, this particular property. We did have uh, one email from a community member uh, expressing some concerns she had about the property and we have been working with her uh, to try to address and resolve her concerns. Um, so with the evidence that's been presented, we hope you guys will approve our request for a zone change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we will reserve uh, two minutes for a rebuttal. And so now we are ready to take calls from the member of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should have the call-in number on them now. So you don't need to wait um, until others have spoken because when you call, you're put into a queue and that will automatically put you in line to speak. Everyone will have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address and whether you support or oppose the project. We don't have a visible timer, so uh, Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds left of your two minutes. And then she'll also let you know when you when the time is run out. We appreciate everybody abiding by the, the two-minute time limit. And so now while we wait on folks to call in, um, Lisa, did we receive any emails on this issue? Hi, Chairman. We received uh, one email in opposition uh, prior to the previous meeting. Thank you. And Sean, do we have any callers in the queue? Chair, we do not currently have any callers in the queue, so we'll take a brief pause and then I'll check back in. Thank you. Chair, we do not have any callers in the queue for this item. Okay, thank you. And so in, does the applicant wanna add anything else? We didn't have any, op, you know, other than uh, the one opposition letter and email, and I think that they're trying to address it. Do you have anything else that you wanna state? No, sir, I really don't have anything else at this time. Okay, thank you. And I did not see uh, the council member. I did, I did not see Councilman Taylor. Hi, hi Chairman, this is Lisa. Uh, Councilman Taylor is not on the line. Thank you, thank you. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And since we didn't hear any, have any um, opposition from callers, let's try to see if um, there's any discussion from any of the commission members, any commissioners. And if you do, please raise your hand, icon hands or verbally state you would like to discuss. If not, how about a motion from one of the commissioners? You'll... Commissioner Tibbs, you wanna make a motion? Um, I was just going over to the uh, hand ties. Yes, I uh, make, in, make a motion to approve staff recommendation. That's a proper motion and Commissioner Haynes. Second. And proper second. Any discussion if the commissioners would raise their icon hand or verbally state they would like to discuss? Seeing none, we're ready for a roll call vote on this item. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. I mean, <laughs> Council A. Murphy. <laughs> Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it. And it's adopted. We are now on to the last item, item 26. And that is Jason. Hey, this is Jason Swaggart again, and I will be presenting item 26, 
Next slide. This is a request to subdivide two parcels located in Neely's Bend into five single family residential lots. Next slide. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. Next slide. This slide identifies the location of the site in Neely's Bend. The site is outlined in red. Taylor Park is behind the site and is represented by the green color. The total area outlined in red is approximately 29 acres. The boundary within the proposed subdivision is a little over 17 acres. And I will go over the difference in the acres when I go over the subdivision detail. Next slide. This is the aerial of the site. The two parcels that make up the site are outlined in blue. There's currently a home on each of the two parcels. The site contains open field and wooded areas. There are pockets of steep slopes that run parallel to a stream near the back of the site. Next slide. The zoning is RS80. RS80 permits single family only and requires a minimum lot size of 80,000 square feet. The surrounding zoning is also RS80. Please keep in mind that this request is not a zone change and the proposed subdivision is utilizing existing development rights. Next slide. This is the proposed five lot subdivision. The proposed lots are outlined in red and include approximately 17 acres within the boundary. The area highlighted in blue is outside of the plat boundary and will remain as an acreage tract. State law does not require gr lots greater than five acres to be platted. The acreage tract is approximately 10 acres. The largest lot in the plat boundary is approximately 192,630 square feet. And the smallest lot is approximately 139,271 square feet in size. Access to each lot will be from Neely Finn Road. Next slide. The site is within a rural, neighbor, or rural maintenance policy area. In order to achieve harmonious development, the Planning Commission has adopted subdivision regulations that include standards for specific transects. The rural character subdivision regulations found in Chapter 4 are utilized for subdivisions located within the rural maintenance policy area. Next slide. Chapter 4 includes two, cha two character options for development of land in rural maintenance policy areas. This plat utilizes the countryside character design open alternative option. This option is for subdivisions with existing street frontage without existing vegetative or topographical screening. In addition to meeting the base zoning requirements found in the zoning code, the open alternative option includes additional standards for setback, lot depth, lot size, and lot frontage. It also includes standards for street lights and cluster lot subdivisions, which are not relevant to this proposal. As proposed, all five lots meet standards for the open alternative option. The regulations require a minimum 260-foot building setback. Except for lot one, all lots have setbacks greater than 300 feet. Lot one includes an existing home that will remain and does not have to meet the standard. The regulations require a minimum lot depth of 560 feet. The depth of all five lots is greater than 700 feet. The regulations require a minimum lot size of 139,196 square feet. Lot five is the smallest and it is 139,271 square feet. The regulations require 185 foot minimum lot width along Neely Finn Road and the narrowest lot is 200 feet. Next slide. In conclusion, staff is recommending approval with conditions as the proposed five lot subdivision meets all standards of the countryside character design open alternative option found in chapter four of the subdivision regulation. Also, the report was published last week included two conditions by the state. The report indicated that public works approved with conditions. However, public works approved the plat without conditions. The two conditions listed in the published report are not appropriate. If the commission approves this plat, then please indicate that the public works conditions as well as condition three at the end of the report do not apply. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And we'll open this item for public hearing. And Sean, do we have the applicant on the line? We do have representatives for the applicant and they are unmuted so you can recognize them. Excellent. And the applicants will have 10 minutes. You can save two of your 10 minutes for rebuttal. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Thank you. Eric Olson, Anderson Del Caps, 618 Grasmere Park Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the proposal is for five lights. Uh, lots, as Mr. Swaggart said, um, we're kind of meeting the conditions of the, uh, for the uh, requirements of the RS-80 zoning and also the uh, rural characteristics, uh, characteristics of the land. Um, and I'll leave my remaining time to answer any questions that may come up.
Thank you. And so we are now ready for, uh, and just, uh, I know the council member is, is on the line and we always allow the council member to go last after all of the, the testimony. And so we are now ready to take calls from members of the public. We really appreciate y'all calling in. Um, your screen should have the show, the call in number. Um, please, uh, this is the last case that we're hearing. So please call in now. You'll be placed into a queue. You don't have to wait. Um, until each speaker is finished. So while we're waiting, um, also a reminder, uh, when you're speaking, third, uh, we'll let you know you have two minutes to speak. We'll let you know when you when you have 30 seconds left. And Sean will also let you know when your time is up. And so we, while we're waiting on the public to call in, uh, Lisa, any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. We received um, we received emails from four people in support, and we received emails from six people in opposition. Okay, thank you. Sean, do we have any callers? Chair, I believe the phone is ringing right now, so bear with us just a moment, and we'll confirm if it's for this item. Thank you. And Chair, you now have the first caller on this item. Excellent. Welcome. And uh, you have chance to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may be. Yes, my name is Joe Willis. Um, I reside at 2219 Neely's Bend Road, which is near the end of, of Neely's Bend Road. Um, I was born here in Madison. I was born uh, actually a little less than two miles from the location of this development at the, the old Madison Hospital. Um, and so if, if you're not familiar with Neely's Bend, Neely's Bend Road is about six miles in length. Um, this proposed development is probably four miles, maybe a little over down Neely's Bend. Um, and it's a dead end. Neely's Bend is a dead end road, which means there's one way in and one way out. Uh, we have a, a tremendous amount of traffic congestion. Um, several years back, Metro decided that Neely's Bend had been the most dangerous road due to accidents in Metro, and actually it had that score for two years running. So this is um, you know, a, a consideration that needs to be taken into, into that. Um, the, the big thing about Neely's Bend is it's a rural community. Um, there, there are large lots. Um, many of the owners um, you know, choose to be here because they either um, farm full-time, uh, which I do, I farm full-time. There are many other hobby farms in the area. And so larger lots allow that. Uh, and the neighbors that have moved in recently, whether they built a house or bought a house, is based on liking that, that expanse of, of rural community that we have here. Um, with the owner um, who's selling the property or who's trying to develop the property, uh, he will sell the property and move on. Um, the rest of us who have to drive past that property will have to live with, with the development for the rest of our lives. Um, I didn't want to live in a subdivision. That's why I bought farmland and acreage uh, near the end of Neely's Bend Road. Uh, if I'd have wanted to live in a subdivision, I would have bought in a subdivision. Oh, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've been a property owner here in Neely's Bend for over 30 years now, and uh, I would uh, would be afraid that we would be setting precedents for smaller lots uh, as opposed to going with larger lots, which is what the community is built on. Uh, I ask, please, uh, deny this proposal and request that they do larger lots and larger expanse of space. Uh, so please deny as, as presented tonight. Thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you for calling, and we appreciate it. Any more callers, Sean? Chair, we currently have no other callers in the queue, so we'll take a brief pause and I'll check back in. Thank you.
Chair, we have no other callers in the queue for this item. Thank you. And we are ready for two minute rebuttal from the applicant and then we'll hear from the council. Thank you. Uh, this is Eric Olson again. Um, as far as the property owner who's developing the property, he actually lives in that existing residence. So uh, it's not like a developer just moving in, developing, getting out of the community. Um, these are all large lots, 3.2 acres and larger, and they're all on septic systems. So they're really subdividing them into smaller lots in the future isn't really feasible without public sewer, which isn't really part of the rural community character overlay that Metro has planned for this area. Um, so I understand his concern, but I believe we've, we've kind of met the intent of trying to keep this a rural community with the larger lots and also the inserted all septic and no new roads. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it is time for Councilor Hancock. Hi, thank you guys for staying on so late. I'm sorry you're missing the debate. I appreciate your all service. And I would also like to say to former council lady, now Commissioner Johnson, I'm sorry about your dog. I know that pulls at the heartstrings. Okay, so um, I did not grow up in Madison. I was fortunate enough to um, find a old log cabin here in 2006. The first thing I did when I was looking at the house is drive to the end of the bend and um, and see the park. There were no greenways. I called the parks and asked if they planned on building greenways. They said they've been talking about it for years, but never do it. Um, we moved in anyway, and three months later, the greenways started. And um, that started my um, good, cordial, and friendly relationship with the Forkins. So Mr. Forkin was the council member at the time, and I admired him for the work he did getting the greenways there at the park and even helping the next council person, Mr. Pridemore, helping um, the city negotiate for the Taylor Park and then getting that greenway in there. So I felt um, a strong pull to run for council because of my allegiance to his service and what he did for the community. So I'd just like to thank him for that. And um, he's also a, a collector of land. He has, you know, almost 90 acres here in the bend. And when I was running for council, he helped me and I had no idea about development. I'm not a real estate agent. I'm not a developer. I don't have plans of things I want to build. And, um, and he helped give me some very good advice. And that's, you know, if, um, if the community wants something to change, then it can change, but otherwise, you know, leave it the same. And I realized that um, this does fit the RS80 zoning. And I think the um, community plan is either up for debate or up for misinterpretation. Um, I know that when I called last year, when Mr. Bahaney first asked me about this development and talked to the planning staff, I was told that, you know, if he divided into five acre lots, then there would be, um, no application process necessary for this for this meeting, but he decided to divide it into lots that were a bit smaller, and that's I guess the um, bit of protest we're hearing from both um, Mr. Willis that called in and some of the letters that you're seeing. So I just want to go through a few things that are in the actual rural maintenance policy to address. Um, one thing it says that any new development in the T2 rural maintenance area should be for the use of a conservation subdivision. And, um, and that there should be a significant amount of permanently preserved open space. Now, I realized that there are 10 acres off to the side, but when I met with the um, real estate agent and the surveyor and Mr. Bahaney, they did not tell me what they planned to do with, with that acreage. Um, originally, that was in the plan for proposal with planning, and the two lots that was going to be divided into I guess weren't quite meet, meeting the specs for road front footage and one of them for the size of the lot. So, um, so in cutting those out and, and worrying just about his lot, which he's, I, I think making an acre smaller now and the other four, um, I think the community is a little bit confused because the original plan was submitted with the seven and now there's five, which seems like a win, except that Will that other 10 acres then be divided into two more? And will the road front footage 
requirements be different now based on these new lots? Um, because I know that you look at five on each side. So that's one question. The other um, is that there's a desi desire to retain rural character. It says that in here. And um, even though this meets those particular specs you're looking for for size and road footage, does that still seem rural or um, or are we looking more at a, a suburb? Um, next in the rural maintenance, it says that we need to achieve and maintain healthy watersheds um, and require that the new development be sensitively designed. And I know that um, Public Works looked at this and I just want to mention that the lady across the street emailed me this evening. So I'll forward that to you because she's concerned that she's had tons and tons of runoff from her property um, because she's on the downhill. So any development that comes across the street from her will um, then you know, receive the extra water. And then it says any development in a conservation area, and I believe um, you know, part of this was considered that shall um, require either a rezoning to a specific plan zoning or use of another implementation tool to ensure the intent of the conservation development is achieved. And then again, what the community is saying and on the very end of the rural maintenance description, it says lots are no smaller than the existing zoning and a significant of a, amount of infant space is permanently preserved. And I know that these are no smaller than 70% of the existing zoning five on each side, but but they are a bit smaller. Um, there were a couple of questions I had in the staff review. Um, the preservation of the tree canopy, it says not applicable, but then it says that the urban forester will evaluate trees at the time of permit. So, so that I'm hoping that means it will be applicable at some point. Um, where it says, um, Land set aside, it complies, areas for disposal are not located in conservation lands. And I thought there was kind of a water stream or runoff or something in the back um, that would still touch plots one two, and two, I think. And I didn't know if that applied. Um, Public Works recommendation said providing edge protection between the sidewalk and the detention pond. Are there going to be sidewalks? And proposed retaining wall should be a distance from the right of way equal to the height. Where is this retaining wall? And then it mentions those again under the conditions. So I'm assuming that you guys have answers for me on that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. And we appreciate that. And we'll, uh, I, 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 there were several questions that you had. And so hopefully uh, we will get those, not hopefully, we will get those answered for you momentarily once we close the public hearing. Um, and so seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so we are on discussion. And Lisa, do you want to address some of the council ladies' questions first before we get into discussion? I think it would help. Sure. Hi, or, this is Lisa with Metro Planning, and I will um, attempt to answer the questions. I was trying to take notes. Um, it was moving uh, quickly, so if I missed something, certainly let me know. Um, I wanted to first of all speak to the land use policy and how policy applies when we're looking at subdivisions. Um, something to keep in mind about the rural rural policy is that it was adopted um, it was adopted and created prior to the creation of the rural subdivision regulations. And so the rural policy still refers to conservation subdivisions, which is not a tool that we have any longer. Um, now uh, it should be it reference it. The rural subdivision rural subdivision regulations are what apply. And so from a policy standpoint, the only thing that policy is is used for when looking at subdivisions is telling us which part of the subdivision regulations um, we should be looking at. The rural subdivision regulations were actually created um, in a way to address the concerns that are um, brought up in the rural policy. And so by adopting the rural subdivision regulations, we have adopted standards that ensure that subdivisions within rural areas are meeting the intent of that policy. And so while it mentions conservation subdivision, that's not actually a tool that we have any longer. It was replaced by the rural subdivision regulations. And so that should answer that. Um, there were some questions in regards to the specific um, 
language in the policy. And again, the, the land use policy is used in a very limited way when we're talking about subdivisions. And so those specific things that were brought up in the policy would actually not be applicable in the review as we are only reviewing it against the subdivision regulation, which is the guiding technical document. Um, there was a reference uh, made to um, um, sewer fields not being located within conservation policy. The sewer fields are, if you'll notice on the map that I'm looking, that is on the, is up on your screen right now, the sewer fields are the areas that are shown in these dotted lines along the front. And so those sewer fields are located well outside of any conservation policy, which is located here along the back portion of the site. And so the requirement is, is that you can't have um, sewer fields within conservation policy, and those are well outside of the conservation policy. In regards to the public uh, work conditions, um, as Jason mentioned in his presentation, those conditions were actually included in error. Public Works approved this plat just outright as an approval with no conditions. Sidewalks are not required, nor will they be installed, and those, so those conditions were in error, and we will correct that for the minutes um, prior to adoption. And I would recommend that when you make your recommendation, you, uh, if it's to approve, that you also mention uh, removing those conditions as they were in error and public works approved with no conditions. Um, sidewalks will not be built. Um, I think I addressed the primary concerns. If I've left something out and someone wants to let me know, I'm happy to, to jump back in. So I think the only other one, um, and this may again be um, not part of the rural subdivision regulations um, that doesn't include the conservation, and that's the significant amount of permanently preserved open space. That's correct. So the standards for the rural subdivision, that's, that's right, that would not apply. Um, so because we've adopted rural subdivision regulations, those regulations are going to tell us how the land can develop. There are some rural subdivisions that would create, that would um, include significant amounts of open space. Um, for instance, there, if, if there was no existing street and there were new streets, um, once you start adding new streets that are in a rural area, then you have to set aside certain properties that are called primary conservation land. That is not required for a rural subdivision of this size that has all lots running on an existing street. Thank you, Lisa. And then my only other um, concern or question and maybe the applicant could address this that I'm getting from the constituents, is then what's gonna to happen to those other 10 acres? Are those then gonna be divided into three more lots? Is it gonna be, you know, what's what's the plan there? And does this one, two, three, four, five make that easier since that was, you know, kind of the hiccup before, or um, is that just not relevant? Uh, so it, the 10 acres is being set, set aside as a um, acreage track. And so it, because it's over five acres, or yeah, because it's over five acres, state law says that we um, cannot review it now, or we're not required to review it. Actually, we can't review it if it's over um, five acres. Um, if, some, if they came in and wanted to further subdivide that, we would again review it against the rural regs. Um, you know, I can tell you that it, because of the limited frontage that it has, um, I think it's unlikely that they could subdivide it into three lots, if that was your question. I haven't run those exact numbers, but I think that's unlikely. Thank you. And then my only other point that I forgot to mention, just for the commission to consider as you review um, both the input from the community and from the planning staff, is that um, I drug it down yesterday. I mean, I'm always going up and down, and always been anyway, but I'm never actually counting anything. Um, so yesterday I drove down there and counted. There are exactly 49 driveways leading to houses from Manis Lane um, to the end of the bend. And, you know, adding four extra driveways doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking, you know, like East Nashville or downtown, but this is, a, you know, over 10%. Yeah, thank thank you, Council Lady. We appreciate that. Yes. Uh, all right. So it, it's time for the commissioners to speak. Um, but I thank you very much. Commissioner Tibbs, do you want to go first? 
Um, you know, actually, I feel like it, um, it, it meets the regulations, you know, just, um, I, I think the, it's kind of a, you know, the, the fact that they're not trying to, um, cram too much. I think the large lot, um, I was looking a minute ago back through the subdivision, um, uh, requirements and they seem like they've met them all for this type. I know it's rural and I know that it's um, looked probably difficult for some of the people that have been there for a while, but it, it seems to follow the policy. Uh, so uh, right now I'd be in support. I am support of it. Uh, I'll wait to hear my other um, commissioners to see if there's something different, but I am in support of it. Thank you. Commissioner Sims. Yes, I think that a lot of the public, and it took me forever to understand that subdivision, the division uh, lots for subdivisions really falls under the purview of the state and that we basically have to do what the state tells us to do unless there's compelling reasons uh, for us not to. And unfortunately, um, I don't see anything in here that we could use as such a compelling reason. So my tendency is also to support this, but again, I'll wait for all of our commissioners to, to speak. Thank you, Councilor Mur Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'll say, you know, Councilor Lady Hancock has had her fair share of subdivisions. I think she may have had more subdivisions in this past year than, than I had my entire first term. Um, and, and a lot of times we've struggled with them and put conditions on them, but I think at the end of the day, I, my advice to her is to, to look at her zoning and if her zoning doesn't match what her constituents want, then she needs to apply for zone changes. Um, this is something that, that meets the policy. These are big tracks. I've spent a lot of time down Neely's Bend and there's a park at the end of it. That is lovely. I've walked the area. But if it meets the condition, if it meets the requirements, it meets the requirements. And I think we have to pass it. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I too uh, have nothing to add because this, as much as uh, I hear uh, Council Lady Hancock's a comment and you know supposed to be rural so supposed to be uh not you know uh five or four additional uh driveway coming into existing neely's bend i i feel the same way however uh these you know uh five lots each meet based zoning of rs80 and meet with uh setback and meet clearly you know check every single checkbox we must uh use as a criteria so as much as i do appreciate uh council lady hancock's uh input uh i cannot find any other reason we can use to you know mitigate this so i too have no choice but to support that staff recommendation Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. Um, I'll be consistent. I don't like it, but it follows the policy. It follows, it follows the subdivision regulations. Um, so I don't, I don't think we have a choice. I'll support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Gobble. Am I last? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I support, I agree with staff's recommendation. I'd like to make a motion for approval with conditions and the amendment that clarifies the public works comments. Does that, does that do what I'm supposed to do? Yeah, and, and the public works just a, approved it without sidewalks and the other things in the staff right. report. So that's my motion. That is a proper motion. And is there a, and Commissioner Tibbs a second? A second. That's a proper second. And I do want to say that I really appreciate Council A. Hancock for, for joining us. I always try to give as much leeway to the council members to, she had a lot of good questions and I really appreciate her joining us tonight. I know she's been on the call a long time. Uh, as Council Lady Murphy said, you gotta look at your base zoning if, if 
your constituents um, want smaller lots. I, I don't think it's a particularly a subdivision issue. Uh, these are quite big lots, maybe not as big as we want in that area, obviously. It's a beautiful, beautiful area that is meant to be agriculture, obviously, but it does meet the subdivision right. So I just want to say I appreciate the council lady for, for being on the call. And so thank any you. other- Can I say one yeah. more thing? I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to answer all those questions, Lisa. It was, it was super and it's really good for all the constituents that are listening to learn all the details so that we can move forward, you know, maybe changing the zoning or just understanding better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor. All right, any other discussion from commissioners? If you'll raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Because we have a proper, seeing none, we have a proper motion and a second, and we are ready for roll call. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it, and it's adopted with the amendment. Now, we are... We are on other business and anything that, that completes the public hearing portion and we are on other business under historic. Anything on historic, Mr. Johnson? Yes, uh, Chairman, I do have a quick update uh, from a historic zoning commission. Uh, as you may know, uh, Historic Zoning Commission has been working to uh, update uh, neighborhood con conservation design guideline consolidation project uh, since uh, January of uh, 2019, uh, since they got a grant from Tennessee History Commission. So they have met with a community and started a series of uh, community meeting and so forth. But however, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 situation uh, kind of prevented for the commission to adopt updated uh, design guideline. So to uh, update the community, uh, they have uploaded a five series of neighborhood co conservation design guideline project, and each has about uh, three to five minutes long. So you will understand uh, what uh, is and what is not an overall and a summary. So I encourage you to go to either YouTube, uh, Metro Government, and the Historic Zoning Commission, or uh, you can go to uh, Metro Historic, Historic Zoning uh, website, and then they will show all these five uh, YouTube video about the consolidation project. That's all from me. And thank you so much for everybody, and you know, Council Lady, and you know, a kind comment about my, my family dog. Um, I'm heartbroken, but uh, it was good uh, distraction to attend a uh, planning meeting. And thank you. Well, we're sorry for your loss, Commissioner. Next, we've got parts, Jeff. No report tonight. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Executive Committee, uh, I I will tell you this, I guess uh, the director can add in, um, we are monitoring uh, whether or not the governor is gonna continue to allow electronic meetings. You know, obviously safety for the public, the commissioners and um, the team, the staff team, um, you know, are critical. I'm sure you all have, have been seeing the news of, of uh, in, uh, an uptick in, ca in cases and so, um, we're monitoring that and we're hopeful that, that he will continue to allow us to have electronic meetings. I know it's not ideal, but I feel like the team and, and the commissioners and the public are, are, are responding well uh, to the process. And I want to thank everybody for that. Director, is there anything you want to add to that? Director Kemp, is she still with us? She's unmuted, but I can't hear you, Director. Well, we'll get 
back. And this quick. is Bob. I, she's having trouble unmuting tonight, so I'm, I think that may be the issue. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Bob or Lisa, is there any anything else from that? That that's all for the executive committee. Um, anything else from any other thoughts from? I know the director's having problems getting back unmuting, but anything else, Bob or Lisa? Um, I think uh, she wanted us to talk about notices. Lisa, do you can you give an update on the notices? Yes. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. This is Lisa. Um, so because of certain timing of notices having to be mailed out, um, we are always sort of operating a couple of weeks ahead of things. Um, so we are preparing the notices for the November 12th meeting um, this week. And unfortunately, we have not had, um, we have not heard official word from the governor's office as to whether or not the executive order is going to be extended. And so what we will be doing is sending out notices that do indicate a physical location, but that also have a note that indicate that the meeting may change to be a virtual teleconference. Um, we've had to do this one time prior during COVID, and that was back in no, that was back in September. So we had to send out the notices prior to hearing whether or not the executive order was going to be extended. And so after communicating with our legal team, and Alex can weigh on this if he wants, if he wants as well, um, we determined that this was the best course. And so we will indicate a physical location, but then we will note that it may change and direct people to a website or to our phone or to call us or email and that we will keep things updated as quickly as we hear if the order is extended. That gives us the most flexibility and allows us to meet all of our statutory requirements with the noticing. Alex, you, did Lisa. you want to add anything else to that? I, I think I covered it pretty thorough. Alex Dickerson, Metro Legal, uh, nothing mm -hmm. again, thanks. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Anything else, Bob or Lisa? Or no, I, I believe that was it, Chairman. Well, and, and, and I appreciate uh, you extending your contract. Uh, good, good job, Bob. We, 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 we love you, man. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Next is a legislative update. After Counselor. that shout out for Bob, I don't know what, what more I could have. To we love you too, uh, Counselor. <laughs> it's late night. Um, I, I don't have anything to share tonight. I, I would just say uh, I am trying to put together um, some like a kind of not necessarily orientation, but a, a, a special meeting for the planning uh, planning committee at council. So if there are any topics that y'all as commissioners think that that we as council members should should learn or hear more about, please shoot me an email and share some of that with me um, as I put it together. I mean, it's gonna. I'm gonna just try to have little short segments from from different people on different topics, such as like the vesting rights, subdivision rights, that type of thing. So, if there's anything you think we need to brush up on, please share that with me. Other than that, I'm good to go. Thanks, Chairman. I'm happy to make a motion if we're at the end. We are at the end. Uh, please make a motion. I move to adjourn. And that's a proper motion. And we have a second. And without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you, commissioners, for joining us tonight. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.